so uh, good evening seniors and friends myself dr yashoda agar president of mp state chapter association of gynec oncologist of india i welcome you all in this uh, this in our fourth online uh, scientific meeting since our installation is a society <coughs> our society's motto is to follow not only the agoi guidelines okay so uh, uh, also uh, our motto is uh, that more focus is given for the preventive aspect of the gynec malignancy to aware our root level gynecologists to equip them with knowledge of early diagnosis and to motivate our younger ones our post graduates our research scholars to choose gynec gynec oncology as future career stream so these are the mottos on which our society is mainly focusing Uh, since our installation in the uh, month of october 2020 uh, our is the our society is in infancy period uh, it is still in infancy period but our speakers our office bearers patron have years of experience in gynec oncology women care most important is our speakers who were dedicated academicians clinicians from all over the country and some their experience uh, on us in our first meeting which we had uh, with agoy secretary dr rupinda seko and she delivered her talk on the cervical cancer uh, she has uh, ex she experienced her uh, knowledge her experience with us on cervical cancer management then dr bartha basu dr shankar narayan and dr priya ganesh kumar they shared and guided on cervical cancer care the new guidelines and uh, also the management of the pre invasive lesion and more focus will uh, is to be on the preventive aspect of cervical carcinoma too then our third meeting which was held with dr great dr pk shekran on gestational tetraplastic neoplasia and it was attended by uh, galaxy of speakers not only from our country from outside also from out of the country also dr shalini rajanam and our dr bhagya lakshmi uh, nayak she has given a very uh, informative uh, talk in this uh, meeting and uh, people with uh, these are all the people are with the lifetime dedication in the field of gynec oncology and they deliberated in our society today we are having galaxy of speakers again dr jaydeep bhomik a person with roots in uh, our country and he has worked out of the country all over the world he has spent 30 years of life in gynec oncology care and we are also having speaker dr samir uh, batham from ahmedabad who is the radio and radio oncologist with years of experience in the management of malignancies and dr deepthi gupta from nscb medical college gwalior i welcome you all and our patron chairperson our patron our chairperson dr sb shrivastava sir who needs no introduction uh, i welcome you sir also and our guest dr jyoti mindal she is busy in uh, one of the nhm meeting as soon as she will be free she will join here and dr kavita singh she will also join she, they, both of them are busy in the meeting प्रिया गणेश कुमार एंड डॉक्टर भाग्यलक्ष्मी नायक डॉक्टर कुसुम सिंगल डॉक्टर प्रिया हु इज दर्सन इलेक्ट ऑफ गायनिक ऑनकोलॉजी कमेटी फॉक्सी डॉक्टर भाग्यलक्ष्मी नायक हु इज the chairperson of oncology committee foxy and dr kusum singhal past box president dr mudita talesra who is uh, at present holding the post of secretary in the <laughs> society i welcome you all uh, in today's webinar uh, friends uh, we will start with the introduction of our own dr s bl sir who is chairperson of our society and a very senior uh, person a very graceful personality and uh, dr s bl shivastav sir is uh, member of organizing committee of aicog 1990 pune presently he is working as dean cum professor in hod of gynec oncology cancer hospital and research institute gwalior and uh, he has served uh, the association of gynec oncologists uh, gynecologic oncologists of india in different uh, post joint secretary vice president and uh, he was president of uh, 
Association of Gynec Oncologists of India in the year 2017 and 18. He is life member. Uh, he is member of editorial board of Indian Journal of Gynec Oncology. He is also reviewer of uh, many journals and uh, he is life member uh, of many organizations. Uh, then previously he was director and consultant of Department of Gynec Oncology Builder Hospital uh, Gwalior from 2007 to 2018. Consultant Department of Gynec Oncology and uh, he has served in Army Medical Corps also from uh, 70 to 98, almost uh, 28 years he worked there. So, uh, as Bill Srivastava sir, I welcome you. Uh, you are our patron, you are our guide and uh, chairperson, honorable chairperson also. So, please uh, say a few words of blessing for the, uh, us. Dr. SBL sir. Thank you, Dr. Yashodhara. In fact, uh, I am very grateful to Dr. Yashodhara because when first time it came to my mind that we must have a chapter, MP state chapter, and first person who whose name came in my mind was Dr. Yashodra, who can take the lead and push this uh, state chapter to new heights. Thank you, Dr. Yashodra. I'm grateful to my friend and speaker, Dr. Jadeep Bhomik, who has come all the, matlab, who has accepted our uh, invitation to speak on ovarian cancer at a very short notice. Dr. Bhagilakshmi is very well known to all of us. She is uh, from Katak and she has been associated with all the events, what is happening in Gwalior. She has been giving her helping hand throughout. Dr. Samir Batham, I have not worked with him, but I hear that he is a very, very cooperative and he is very well versed in his profession. And Dr. Priya Ganesh Kumar. In our office bearers, Dr. Jyoti Bindal. She is a patron of, uh, and most of the events are being managed with her guidance only in Gwalior. Dr. Umila Tripathi and Dr. Monica Diwan, they are the secretary and joint secretaries. Now, I'll uh, say very few words about uh, ovarian cancer, that this is the cancer which requires from screening to final treatment and still we are not very sure what is going to happen because whether it is a low grade or high grade, we don't know. And when we search for it, we investigate the case. Most of the patients have this problem because they have vague symptoms. How to reach to the hospital, the patients, they don't know how to diagnose the cases, most of the gynecologists, they don't know. And we need some experts like Dr. Jadi Bhomik to come forward and give few counseling, few words to our uh, gynecologist about how to select the cases and how to cut short the line of the duration, which is being, the time should not be wasted in diagnosis to management. That lag period should be reduced to maximum. Thank you, Dr. Bomik, for accepting our invitation and come forward to speak. I welcome you all on behalf of MP State Chapter. And I assure you that with your good words and with your good motivations and with Dr. Yashodhara God, though I was uh, very keen that Dr. Kavita Singh should also uh, take the lead and be, take responsibility, but probably in subsequent years, she should be able to uh, manage MP state chapter. Uh, after Dr. Yashodra God, she decides, you know, enough is enough. I am not going to continue like this. <laughs> then only the Kavita Singh will come in picture. I expect that, not that I can request only. Thank you so have, much. Sir, your, your words are taken. <laughs> with all due respect. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the kind words and thank you for all the guidance. And uh, I think Dr. Unila Tilpati has joined. Uh, she is secretary of our association. Uh, and uh, Dr. Tilpati, please uh, start first. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Uh, yes. so, Dr. Kavita. Dr. Kavita Singh, welcome. Uh, you have added a new life to this. Uh, light is already there. 
<laughs> we have added a new color to this meeting. And it's my pleasure to introduce you. First, you are a friend. And uh, yes, yes. And you are professor and head of Sengaini at NSCB Medical College in Madhya Pradesh, Jabalpur. And uh, I'm glad she is IACA Fellow Gynae Oncology, Gynecologic Oncology at Roswell Park Cancer Institute, yeah. Buffalo, New York, Memorial <laughs> Hospital, Mumbai, and Regional Cancer Center, Trivandrum. Everybody knows you are a master trainer in WHO, SEARO, and IFCPC. She has teaching experience of 21 years and she is a coordinator medical education unit NSCB MCH Jabalpur since 2015. That means six years. Ex-member ethical committee MP Medical University Jabalpur, secretary institutional ethics committee NSCB MCH Jabalpur uh, in the year 2017 to 2020. And she owes more than 30 publications and is an author of 10 chapters in undergrad, 10th chapter in undergraduate and postgraduate textbooks, 10 chapters. And faculty live workshop, three in 50 cases. And um, my God, she has been a guest speaker for 64 conferences. And she assumes numerous organizational positions. Uh, she's president. Jabalpur OBGY Society in 2013. Oh my God. Uh, there are so many. So welcome. We will cancel everybody's uh, time and uh, yeah. your presence will speak for yourself. Most welcome. I am here for learning. I'm so happy to see SBL, sir. Sir, a very good evening. And you stay the way you are. So, you know, you uh, all the bonds uh, with the uh, Sanskar Dhani Jabalpur. So, very fond memories. And you came to the the Madam Khare, head of the department. Thi, sab ki or it is nice to see Ashutra, Dr. Urmila, and everyone around. So, uh, Gwalior is, uh, you know, you, you all know that it is my Sasural place. So, and uh, so it hardly makes any difference. I am on a home front and I'm going to learn from today's uh, uh, learned uh, presentations by Dr. Bahomik and Dr. Bhatta. So with this, thank you so much, Yashodra, for remembering. I was also with uh, Bindal Madam in another meeting. Uh, maybe she'll be joining. So with that, uh, all the best to all of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kavita, uh, and you have already said what you had to. I now request uh, Dr. Yashodra's slide to be please uh, showed in case. Yeah, yeah. So, although you have spoken first and uh, just because of some physical problem, headache actually, I could join late. I introduced Dr. Yashodra Gaur, who's my friend and colleague and uh, President MPSC Egoi. She's professor in uh, GR Medical College, Gwalia, and she's vice president of MPOGS and vice president Medical Teachers Association. And she has been the president of the Gwalior OBGY Society in the year, just a minute, 2019-20. And she's faculty of FHPHFI. Master trainer. Okay, okay. Master trainer for numerous things, uh, including NHM cervical cancer training program, and member of CISP and MEU of GR Medical College Gwalior. She has numerous life memberships, and she has organized conferences as chairperson MPOG 19 and vice chairperson National EGOI 2018. She has 10 international publications to her uh, cap, and she has been the winner of best poster and best paper presentations. My God, so many awards. Nari ja, ja Kalyani Award, Gwalia Gaurav, you are doctor, best surgeon, Vishish Chikitsak Award, 
and she is an invited faculty in various state conferences and AICOGs. And she has her special area of interest is fetal medicine and high risk pregnancy. And definitely from uh, now on, that means from few months on is uh, oncology. Of course, of course. thank so, you, Devi. <laughs> welcome, Dr. Yashodra. Thank you, Devi. As professor in Diyal Medical College, she has a long experience of teaching of 18 years. And she is uh, my vibrant uh, secretary of MP State Chapter Agoy. Her presence uh, aids many colors and uh, many vibrations in the events. Thank you, Dr. Tripathi. Uh, I think by that time, Dr. Bindal joins, uh, we can start scientific session. Okay, okay. So whenever she joins, we welcome. Welcome, welcome, Jyoti Di. Hello, very nice. Welcome. Introduce again. Um, Dr. Jyoti Bindal is Vice Chancellor, Arbindo University, Indore. Is it, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And uh, she is the present president, Association of Madhya Pradesh Ops and Gaini Societies. She is member COVID Technical Advisory Committee. Member State PCPNDT Committee. Member Core Committee, National Human Rights Commission. Um, very different uh, editions now. Recipient of Foxy Shiromani Award just last year. And she is ex dean and CEO of MGM Medical College Indore, ex director Gwalior Mansik Arog Shala, and past president Gwalior Opsitic and Gynic Society. And she has been our past colleague. She has been professor and head Gwalior Medical College. And she has been superintendent of uh, J Group of Hospitals. Oh, sweet, oh, sweet. Um, welcome, Jyoti Di. I want you to uh, bless the society and by your few words of wisdom. Uh, at the outset, I'm very thankful to Dr. S. B. L. Shivastav and Yashodra and the whole team for giving me the honor to be a part of this wonderful webinar we are having today. Ovarian carcinoma definitely remains a, a very, very important field for all of us. However, at the same time, I uh, would like to once again apologize for being late for the meeting as I was uh, actually, you know, it was a very something very important what we were doing. We were setting up the guidelines for uh, COVID affected patient, uh, pregnant patients. So there are so many myths and uh, um, guidelines moving around. So the government of Madhya Pradesh has decided to make a con consolidated guideline like we are issuing for various general patients. This is exclusively for pregnant patients. So that is what we were discussing. But coming again back, I'm so happy that this uh, branch of uh, um, Oncology field is doing so great. And I think Yashodra is really leading by example. And we are having some very important topics around every time we have this webinar. So all my best wishes for uh, this program today. And maybe I think we are already late in starting the scientific session. So please go ahead. Thank you very much, Mansar. Thank you, Jyoti Di. And I now declare the scientific session open and invite our first set of chairpersons, Dr. Bhagya Lakshmi Nayak and Dr. Priya Ganeshan. Dr. Bhagya Lakshmi, uh, I would like to have her slide. Yes. Good evening, ma'am. It's my pleasure to introduce you. Uh, she's MD, FICOG and PhD and Associate Professor at Department of Gynae Oncology AHPGIC Katak, and she is chairperson oncology committee Foxy. So we are so lucky to have you today here. Governing, Senior. Senior, Senior. thank you. <laughs> Government governing council member elect of AICOG, and she has been vice president Egoin India, joint secretary Egoin, and executive member. ISCCP East Zone. And she has to her credit Yuva Foxy oration, Dr. Usha Saraya oration, Dr. Abha Singh oration, Shireen Mehta ji guest lecture award. Great, ma'am. And she's assistant editor of Indian Journal of Gynae Oncology, peer review. 
and Indian Journal of Surgical Oncology. Welcome, ma'am, as chairperson. Thank you so much, Dr. Urmila. Yeah. And next, I would like to have the slide of Dr. Priya. Welcome, Dr. Priya. You are here. Yeah, I'm very much here, Dr. Urmila. Congratulations. We are all so lucky that you have won the Corona Award. <laughs> Oh God, what a award to be won. <laughs> nah, 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 it, it had to be won. I mean, you are fit and fine and uh, sharing with us. You know, the whole MPSC, the whole EGOI, whoever knew you in person was praying for you. I know. Thanks a lot. I think that's where I am today. I mean, I am in front of you. That's the reason. <laughs> uh, let me introduce you through slide. One, one second, please. Yeah. She's chairperson elect. Foxy Oncology Committee 2021 to 23 and WHO IARC Foxy Colposcopy Course Convener. And she has trained so far more than 1,000 gynecologists. Master trainer for state government of so many states, Madhya Pradesh, MP, JNK, for cervical cancer prevention under Ayushman Bharat Yojana. And she is medical director of Srinivas Healthcare premium healthcare in preventive oncology, having 26 preventive oncology main offices at Mumbai and Delhi. And of course, she's an author of colposcopy in practicing gynecology, atlas in colpos colposcopy and cytology. And she has been the founder secretary of Thane Obstetric Gynec Society, PhD guide for preventive oncology at Bharti Vidya Peet, uh, she has been organizing secretary for the Foxy RCOG International Conference in Preventive Gynecology, Goa, 2016. Office reviewer, reviewer oncology session of Jogi Journal of Foxy. She has to accredit more than, more than 60,000 colposcopies and treated 3,000 precancerous lesions, thus saving hysterectomies. Awards in purple. Purple is a good color, yeah. She has won National Z Swas Award from Union Health Minister Shri J.P. Nadda and Mayor Thane Gaurav Award from State Minister Shri Eknath Shinde. IMA Excellence Award, Wonder Foxy, Foxian Award and as well as Economic Times Best Doctor Award. Ma'am, may you get uh, keep getting more and more awards and... Uh, Keep spreading the knowledge of colposcopy, uh, colposcopy and uh, keep uh, training the doctors to, I mean, in a way, creating grassroots workers for the prevention of on onco insult, I mean, uh, of cancers in the vast Indian population. Thank you are doing a great job. God give you good health. Please continue with it. And Thank you very much, Take care. Take Thank you. Care. And take over the session of introducing the speakers of the first okay. session. Thank you so much. We will, shall we have the first speaker's slide? Yeah, so thank you very much. At the outset, let me thank uh, uh, the esteemed uh, Agwa MP State Chapter, uh, uh, Dr. Yashoda Gaur, my dear friend, Dr. and respected Dr. Bindal, uh, Dr. Uh, Edgar Srivastav, sir, and uh, Thanks, Dr. Bhagya, to chair the session with me. We have, um, as we all know, uh, that ovarian cancer stands, uh, incidences rate are increasing and being a silent uh, disease, it's detected late and thus posing challenges for the treatment part as well. So I was just going through the stats and I just found that as per Globacon 2020, the estimated number of new cases for the cancers from India. And I find ovary uh, breast is the first, as we all know, 26.3%. Uh, cervix is the 18.3% of all the cases of uh, cancers in women, and ovary stands with 6.7%. So we have with us our first speaker, Dr. Jayadeep Bhomek. Um, uh, most of us know him as a great academician and is the head of the department HOD Gynecological Oncology at uh, Tata Medical Center, Kolkata. And then um, before relocating to India in 2009, Dr. Bhomek worked as a consultant gynecologist in South Wales, UK. He uh, was an honorary lecturer um, at that um, Wales College of Medicine. And um, also uh, he has been, he's a trainer at, uh, he was a trainer at 
uh, Wells uh, Institute for Minimal Access Therapy and a BFSCP accredited trainer in colposcopy. So Dr. Bhomik has made significant contributions and development of UK-based protocols and some of them of his own researches for cervical screening and colposcopy. I know him as a trainer for, uh, for colposcopy and um, yes, uh, he is a wonderful trainer. At Tata Medical Center, Dr. Bhomik has created and fostered the gynecological oncology department now comprising of five consultants and several trainees who are providing evidence-based uh, modern scientific treatment to women cancers for, so, uh, suffering from cancers of reproductive organs. Apart from leading high-end uh, clinical services like robotic surgery, advanced ovarian cancers, he's associated with various research projects from, uh, projects from this institute. We were just hearing him, he was saying that he gets a lot of fellows from other uh, countries as well, um, PhDs and um, uh, DNB candidates, and is currently leading a multi-center DBT fund, uh, funded uh, translational research. So his most notable contribution is in the development of structured training program, that's wonderful in gynecological oncology is most needed um, um, as a sector. It's really needed that we have a structured training program uh, for our upcoming gynecologist. And this also will initiate uh, the, the interest in oncology. And uh, that initially started as a fellowship at uh, TMC is now eventually taken up as a national board of examination for this DMT. So I welcome you, Dr. Bhomik. The stage is all yours. Um, kindly go ahead, please. Dr. Bhagya will be doing this now, I suppose. Second speaker, I thought Dr. Bhomik will first take his lecture. Okay then, so Dr. Samir Batham, uh, yes. sorry, I have not known you personally though, but whatever I've heard, you are a really great person in the field of radiation oncology. He did his MBBS from Bhopal and MD in radiation oncology from MGM Medical College Indore. Presently working as senior consultant in the Department of Radiation Oncology at HCG Cancer Center Ahmedabad and having experience of over 14 years. So his areas of interest include gynecological, gastrointestinal and head and neck cancer. So he's a good friend to a gynecologist, uh, gynecologist. oncologist. He is trained at Ames, New Delhi, uh, Riggs Hospital, Copenhagen, University of Heidelberg, Germany uh, in precision radiotherapy. He won the travel grant award at fourth annual meeting of Federation of Asian Organization for Radiation Oncology held at Shenzhen. He is the treasurer of Association of Radiation Oncologists of India, Gujarat chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, radiation is now having some upcoming role in uh, ovarian cancers because as we know that sometime in the duration of the disease, sometime or the other, they will surely go to chemo resistance. And so there is now with the improvement in the the techniques of radiation, I think there are some comebacks of radiation, uh, role of radiotherapy in ovarian cancer. So we are eagerly waiting to hear from you, Dr. Samir. So over to both of you. Thank you so much. Yes, fine, fine. So very good evening. Uh, it's, a, it's a real privilege and honor for me to be talking about ovarian cancer. Uh, um, inviting me and allowing me to interact. So in today's talk, I am basically going to give you um, an overview of the burden of a disease, the different types of ovarian cancers we see, and then I'll mention about the screening and prevention of ovarian cancer. And then I'll highlight the most important part of the of, of uh, management of ovarian cancer, basically on the epithelial cancer part. So how we assess and uh, if we suspect a patient with an ovarian neoplasm, uh, I, I'll concentrate on the surgical management of cancer of the ovary, and I'll mention uh, hypothermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy, and then also mention about the standard chemotherapy and the targeted treatment that we do in ovarian cancer management. So. Ovarian cancer is not that uh, common a disease. However, it, um, it is seventh most common cancer among women all over the world, but um, its, it's, it's case fatality ratio is about 62%. Whereas in India, uh, it is the fourth most common cancer and the case fatality ratio is much higher, it's 74%. What we do at Tata Medical Center in Kolkata, of course, this is the commonest gynecological malignancy that we see over here. Of course, we are a center where uh, it, it's a um, trust hospital. Um, so 
only patients who can uh, patients who can afford to pay. Of course, we have got um, um, facilities for treatment of poorer patients, but majority of the patients which whom we see are actually tertiary uh, referred patients. Um, so the majority of the patients of our uh, purview is ovarian cancer. That is the bulk of our uh, patient group. So if you look at malignant tumors of the ovary, they are of two types, primary and secondary. Now, whenever we are treating a patient with an ovarian mass, certain things are very important to understand from the very beginning. Any mass in the ovary does not mean it's ovarian cancer. Even if it's an ovarian cancer, it doesn't mean that it has originated from the ovary. So it can be a primary ovarian cancer, that means the tumor has originated from the ovary itself, or it can be a secondary ovarian cancer, that means it has originated from another organ, it could be the breast, it could be the stomach, it could be the appendix, and then migrated or metastasized in the ovary. So the treatment for these two conditions are completely different and it should not be mixed and must be made appropriate um, management plan once you have made the proper diagnosis. Primary ovarian tumor are of three types, uh, carcinoma sarcoma and carcinoma sarcoma. So ovarian carcinoma, I'm concentrating on, it can be epithelial cancer, which is type two and type one. In the type two, which is the most common, is the high grade serous cancer. In type one, you have the low grade serous cancer, although it's called serous cancer, based on the morphology, but uh, according to the, the immunohistochemistry, the molecular markers, uh, the low-grade serous cancer and high-grade serous cancer are completely different. So they are the type 1s, the low-grade serous cancer, mucinous ovarian cancer, clear cell carcinoma, and the endometrioid carcinoma, the completely different area of the of, uh, treatment. Of course, there are non-epithelial ovarian cancers, which include germ cell tumors, sex cord stromal tumors, and there are any other different varieties of ovarian carcinoma, there are rare varieties. I'm not going, to, going into the detail of those. So I think this is the most important part of the entire discussion that we'll have today, that when a patient comes to us where we are suspecting an ovarian neoplasm, how we systematically and stepwise approach these patients and treat them. So clinical presentation is bizarre. I mean, they can present to you with increasing abdominal girth, they can present to you with lower abdominal pain. It could be an incidental diagnosis of a pelvic mass, but majority of the time they're actually referred to us by gastroenterologists or physicians or any other person because the patients are presented to them with vague symptoms, bloating, uh, swelling of abdomen. Of course, hardly ever you'll see patients like this, but yes, swelling of the abdomen, bloating and everything else continues to be part of the presentation of ovarian cancer. And this is the reason why they are so late in uh, appearing, um, uh, attending to the uh, gynecological oncologist or... Uh, so the first question we need to answer, am I dealing with an ovarian mass? Okay, so there are gynecological conditions which mimic ovarian mass, but may not be ovarian mass. Okay, it, it can be a hydrosalpins or a pyrosalpins, it can be a cyst in the fimbria. Can you excuse me for a second? Yes. Very sorry, I had to just ask people to shut down. Anyway, so it could be hydrosalpins or parasalpins, it could be a fimbrial cyst, it could be a pedanculated fibroid. Also, it can be a non gynecological condition, like it can be a full bladder. I remember my, the case my, in my DNB exam uh, many, many years ago was actually uh, given to me assuming that it was a um, ovarian cyst, but uh, naively I thought it was a full bladder. And I passed my exam because uh, my, my examiner was very pleased that I <laughs> she was catheterized and the cyst went off. So full bladder can present with, uh, um, with uh, symptoms of an ovarian tumor. Uh, uh, gastrointestinal and stromal tumors has also um, comes in the differential mesenteric cyst, retroperitoneal sarcoma, appendicular mass, anything can present like a mass in the lower abdomen and mimic an ovarian tumor. So we need to try and answer whether the, if I think it's an ovarian tumor, is it a benign tumor or a malignant tumor? Second, if I, if it's a benign tumor, if it's a primary benign tumor or secondary tumor? Next is, if I think 
it's a malignant ovarian tumor, it's a malignant primary ovarian tumor. The next question I need to answer is, is it early or an advanced ovarian cancer? So we need to take a full history, including the family history of cancer. Uh, there should be a thorough clinical examination. We should not forget to examine the neck and the breast, and there should be a rectal examination done. I'm going to come to that in more details in my subsequent slides. Uh, we have to do tumor markers. I mean, the epithelial tumor markers for older patients are CA125, CA99, and CEA. Um, alpha fetoprotein beta ACG and LDH are done uh, for a younger age group, if I'm suspecting a non epithelial uh, and, or a germ cell tumor. Inhibit A and B uh, are done in very selected cases, especially when there's ovarian mass presenting with postmenopausal bleeding or a uh, early uh, menarche uh, in, in some girls. So it's normally extremes of age. So you have to use the tumor markers uh, according to what you think is the right approach. The various forms of imaging, um, ultrasound scan is the most useful uh, imaging tool to differentiate um, a, a, a malignant ovarian tumor from a benign cyst. Uh, it, of course, it is user dependent and the, the person behind the machine is, is very important to tell you whether it's benign or malignant. MRI scan has come up uh, uh, with a lot of lot more uh, advantages over and above ultrasound scan to tell us whether the tumor is benign or malignant. CT thorax and whole abdomen is normally done if you have already made a diagnosis of um, an ovarian neoplasm, which is probably malignant, then we need to make a metastatic workup and we'll do CT thorax and abdomen. One thing I've struck, struck off is PET scan. PET scan is not necessary. Mind you, PET scan is not necessary for the initial workup of an ovarian cancer. It is extremely misleading. You can have an intestinal tuberculosis, which will present with multiple metastatic disease as if uh, throwing all over the body, but uh, it may not be ovarian cancer at all. So ovarian PET CT should not be used at the initial workup of uh, ovarian cancer. Um, so having that in the background, I've just given you, giving you a planning algorithm. First, of course, we take a history, we do a thorough clinical examination, tumor markers and imaging, and by which we also do radiological staging. So we confirm, yes, this is an ovarian mass, not um, other organ. You have to be certain that the tumor is benign. If you think certainly, no doubt at all, this is a benign tumor, please go ahead with laparoscopic surgery, but, but, but please remember, you have to be absolutely certain that you are dealing with a benign tumor. If it is malignant, if you have a single doubt about its uh, possibility of malignancy, do not ruin a patient's life. If the patient, if, uh, no matter how good a surgeon you are, no matter how beautiful the abdomen will look after your surgery, patient's life is most important. We can make a completely curable condition into an incurable one if I am messing up or trying to uh, remove a, a malignant ovarian tumor through the laparoscopic hole. So if you think it's possibly malignant, uh, if it's only an ovarian mass, there's no peritoneal disease on CT scan or any other imaging, then we, can, we should go for laparotomy, frozen and proceed. If you have the facility to do frozen section, please go ahead with the frozen section and do the surgery, completion surgery at the same time. If you do not have uh, frozen section facilities, so be it. You can just take the tumor out, send it for biopsy, counsel the patient from beforehand that we will take the next steps as per the report of the, uh, of the biopsy. If the biopsy report is negative, there's no malignancy, you don't need to go back in. But if it is malignant, <coughs> of course, you'll have to go back in and, and, and complete the procedure. If you see ovarian mass with an extra ovarian disease, so there's peritoneal metastasis, momental thickening, disease under the diaphragm, wherever you see there is a peritoneal metastasis, then it's best to obtain a biopsy from the metastatic deposits. Because as I said, ovarian tumor can be primary, can be secondary. And it's important that we know the diagnosis before we actually venture in, before I, I think of giving any chemotherapy or giving or doing surgery in these patients. Again, more one important uh, um, message from me over here, please avoid fine needle aspiration cytology. It is just a misleading, just telling you that we have got malignant cells is not enough. If you have the, if the laboratory has a facility of doing cell block from the FNAC, fair enough, you can sometimes get a diagnosis. But ideally you should do a biopsy. Take a core biopsy and do immunohistochemical studies if possible, because what we need to know is the origin of a disease. 
um, if, if the patient has got a stomach cancer with metastatic deposits in the ovary and you, your surgery is absolutely wasted of time and you're wasting your money for the patient. So don't do that. Do a biopsy first, make sure it is originating from the ovary and take it forward from there. So if the, the um, tumor, if, if the disease is resectable and the patient is fit, you take the, take the patient for, um, for surgery, upfront surgery. If it is not resectable and the patient is, or the patient is unfit, then we give a neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by uh, interval development surgery with or without heart attack. Now the resectability and unresectability of a disease is entirely dependent on the person's expertise, the team, and the infrastructure, everything that's available. So it, it, it depends on the person. It not, doesn't depend on what you see on the image. What is resectable to me may not be resectable to um, uh, a doctor um, sitting in a district hospital. What is unresectable to me may be resectable to a doctor sitting at, at MSKCC. So it, it, the resectability and unresectability is very much user dependent and you have to um, respect that and, and act accordingly. Whatever resources you have, whatever expertise you have, you make the most of it. So if there's no um, shame in saying that I cannot receive disease, I'm sending out for new chemotherapy. I'll, I'll, I'll try and come back and, and do it later. Both are equally acceptable treatment. Of course, if it's not an ovarian mass, um, please refer to other department. And if in, in case of a full bladder, of course, a gynecologist can put a catheter in the bladder and drain the bladder out. So that is about the preparation of a patient for um, taking up a surgery. So before I go into um, more details about the operation and other things about ovarian cancer, just a few uh, words about screening and prevention. We never believed before that um, ovarian cancer can be prevented. I mean, we've got lots of discussion about cervical cancer, uh, preventable disease, uh, sometimes also uh, endometrial cancer, but not ovarian cancer because it's a silent killer, as Madam previously mentioned. Uh, it's a silent killer and we um, diagnose it very late. So is there a way of um, preventing ovarian cancer? Ian Jacobs in, in London many, many years ago started thinking about it. And then, of course, when he relocated to Australia, Usha Menon took, took it over from University College of London and, and started and, and did a lot of work on uh, preventing ovarian cancer in the community. Now, there are certain things we know, and there are many more things that we do not know. We know that, of course, uh, there are predisposing factors for ovarian cancer that could be germline mutations. Most common are the BRCA1, BRCA2 mutation. And there could be other genetic mutations. You can have Lynch syndrome, PAL-B, uh, PAL-B2, TP53, and P10. So all these uh, mutations can lead to, uh, can predispose to ovarian cancer. And also there could be other factors. Um, if there's a family history, if there's a personal history of, uh, of cancer, so somebody who has suffered from breast cancer is also at a higher risk of developing uh, ovarian cancer. Endometriosis, you know it better than I do, that uh, can lead to uh, sclerosal carcinoma of the ovary. Um, and also, it is also important to understand the reproductive history. Why? Because uh, if the woman um, is nulliparous, uh, who had had who have had uh, treatment for fertility, they are at increased at increased risk of developing ovarian cancer in the future. As sequential hormone replacement therapy over a long period of time may lead to uh, ovarian cancer. This is a, uh, a doubtful um, uh, proposal I, I've made because um, not everybody agrees with that. But we all agree that uh, there are certain factors which actually reduces the risk of ovarian cancer. Uh, having more children, use of oral contraceptive device can actually reduce the risk of ovarian cancer. So actually combined oral contraceptive pill is um, recommended as a treatment of prevention of ovarian cancer in young women who have a strong family history. So what can we do? We can, um, if there is a strong family history of ovarian cancer, we can do uh, pedigree analysis, you need to have a genetic counselor and uh, genetic testing. We can um, test the um, the white cell from, from blood, the different genetic mutations and different gene panels uh, to come to a conclusion uh, whether the patient is actually carrying any mutation. Two important studies I'll mention here about ovarian, ovarian cancer screening. One is the UK TOC study um, led by Professor um, Usha Menon. It was a huge study. It was randomization of more than 2 lakh women, 200,000 women were uh, randomized into three arms. There was one uh, multimodal 
uh, screening, which included uh, alpha uh, sorry, um, serum CA125 and periodic ultrasound scan. 25% of the patients were assigned to this group. Second group was uh, ultrasound scan only, 25% was assigned to this. And there was no screening, but the patients were followed up as, as, as a cohort, uh, the other 50%. So the idea was to establish the effect of early detection by screening on ovarian cancer mortality. Our ultimate outcome was to look at the mortality. And of course, the initial part was that we showed how many ovarian cancer cases were diagnosed. In none of the three cases, there were any difference. So whether we are doing multimodal screening, whether we're doing ultrasound scan screening, or we are no, no screening, the people who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer at the end was almost equal. So it did not actually lead to increased rate of diagnosis. Next is looking at those who died of ovarian cancer. Again, this study found that there was no difference. Whether we are screened with multimodal screening method, whether there was ultrasound scan or no screening. At the end of their study, uh, Usha has mentioned that they noted some encouraging evidence of a mortality reduction in years seven to 14. Now, again, um, this is not accepted by everybody. Even the UK government has not accepted uh, UK talk, uh, accepted that it can be used, uh, the, the multimodality screening can be used as a method of ovarian cancer screening. This looks very disappointing, but there are more encouraging facts. The UK Fox trial, the UK Fox trial, it is, it is still maturing, the data is still maturing, but we have some uh, data from them. Um, initially, they started with, um, with screening um, women uh, who has had Familial, family history of ovarian cancer. Um, I was lucky to be involved with this study initially. And in, in that, we, when we were doing uh, the uh, screening, uh, annual ultrasound scan with CA125, only after two years, it was realized that women were actually getting ovarian cancer during the interval period. So if I'm doing the first screening on the 1st January 2010, and by 2011, the, when they come back for the screening, they're already um, got advanced ovarian cancer. So the protocol had to be changed. So the part two of the protocol started, that was done and it was started in 2007, that women were actually screened with annual ultrasound scan, but they had CA125 once every three months. So that, that's how the protocol changed. And then of course, the initial reports suggest that there was earlier diagnosis in more patients where this type of screening is used. There's still the, the, the mortality uh, data is still awaited. And I'm, I'm hopeful that um, this will at least show us some light in prevention of ovarian cancer, at least to those where there is um, risk of ovarian cancer in the family. So that's how I propose an algorithm for screening ovarian cancer. If there is a family history of uh, ovarian or breast cancer, or the woman has had breast cancer herself, then um, of course, if this is not like not there, then we don't need no intervention necessary. If it is there, then uh, the first thing we should do is to do genetic testing. It is easily available now. Many labs in the country are doing genetic testing. Um, um, that they, they can be done at, at, a, at a very easy way. So once we have genetic testing, if the genetic testing is positive, then if they are young, then you screen them and put them on contraceptive pill. Uh, screening algorithm uh, as in the UK, UK, UK Fox study. So annual ultrasound scan and three monthly uh, CA125. And if they're older, complete with the family, then you can offer them risk reducing surgery. That means you can take the ovaries out, the fallopian tubes out, um, um, the uterus, the hysterectomy, it's, it's more and more major surgery. Um, uterus may not be removed all the time. And in fact, I have got a patient who has um, who wishes to maintain her uh, femininity, preserving the ovaries. So she uh, agreed to remove all of the fallopian tubes only. So different ways of uh, doing this reducing surgery that you, you can plan. If the genetic test is negative, but she has a positive family history, it doesn't mean that we can actually completely disregard this patient. The important thing is that, of course, we can test for the known mutations. There could be more unknown mutations and the patient can still be at risk of developing ovarian 
or breast cancer. So she should be counseled properly. She should be counseled. She can undergo, uh, still undergo screening. She can still undergo risk reduction surgery. It's up to her. It's up to her to make the decision. But we should be taking, uh, making her take the decision after that informed, um, informed decision making process should be there. Now coming back to the uh, uh, core part of my talk, which is um, management of cancer of the ovary. Initial part, first of course, is the evaluation of the patient. When the patient comes to our consultation, of course, they will have nurses' observation of, of the vitals. Then they will come to me or my uh, my team for the history taking. So there should be a very detailed history taking, the history of the illness, and if she has received any treatment so far. That should be thoroughly noted. Family history a mandatory part of our history taking um, because that will help us not only to understand the, the disease biology, but also for the treatment in the future. Obstetric history is important because I mean we can still consider fertility preservation in certain ovarian cancer patients. We need to know the medical history and drug history. And of course, if I'm going to plan a surgery, I need to know if she had been operated on before. Huh. Then she needs a clinical examination. Clinical examination is not just a pelvic examination for, of the gynecologist. You have to examine the patient from head to foot. Uh, you need to know whether she is anemic. You need to check whether there are neck glands. You need to check whether there are axillary glands. You need to check the breast and do a pelvic examination, but do not forget a rectal examination. Because if it's an ovarian tumor, it is um, quite possible that the tumor will be invading the rectum and you can feel the tumor in the pouch of doctors better uh, if you do a rectal examination. And when you're planning your surgery, especially if you're planning to remove the rectum during your surgery, this examination is very important at the time of your surgery. After the first consultation, um, you have to decide what are you dealing with. If, is this a primary cancer? If it's a primary cancer, what is the grade? What is the stage? Uh, what are the rele relevant investigations we need to do? Of course, there are two reasons why we do investigations. First of all, for the diagnosis and then to plan treatment. So um, we also need to find out if any support service is necessary. They, they are, these are usually elderly patients. There could be comorbidities. There could be other social factors influencing her the decision making process. So all of these should be taken into consideration when you're planning treatment of this patient. Uh, you may need support from your surgical colleagues. Um, of course, um, more and more you work in gynecology oncology units, uh, uh, high volume units, you will need less uh, input from uh, surgical colleagues, but if you're developing your de department, you're developing a service, uh, help from your surgical colleagues is important. Um, X-ray is not that important in the workup of um, chest X-ray, I mean, uh, not that important in the work of ovarian cancer anymore. We prefer to do a CCT of the thorax and the whole abdomen. Not only it allows us to assess the uh, metastatic deposits, if any, in the, in the thorax. It also tells us about the lymph node, uh, lymph nodal involvement. It also tells us about the supraclavicular nodes, which we cannot know, sometimes feel. Uh, can be, there could be deeper nodes. So we, we look at that. MRI is a, is a preferable method, especially when we're looking at, um, at the metastatic uh, tumor deposits in the peritoneum. It's a fantastic tool for that. However, it takes a lot of time. Uh, it takes about uh, an hour to an hour and a half to do uh, a screening for one patient. So if you have a very busy unit, um, doing an MRI scan for all patients of um, COOD is not always possible. We deserve it only for doubtful cases to do an MRI scan of the whole abdomen. PET CT and PET MR, as I said previously, we should not be used as it is, of course, it's used by many people, but it, I, I personally feel it should not be used as the initial workup for the treatment of ovarian cancer. Ultrasound guided biopsy, I already mentioned, it's important that the biopsy, not an FNSC. I need to know the exact nature, the origin of the tumor. FNSC will not always be able to tell me that. Um, ultrasound guided therapeutic, therapeutic procedures can be done. Um, if you are doing the parasynthesis, um, you can do it through a percussion. But if you have an ultrasound machine, you will know how close you were to the bowel. Uh, you just uh, you can, you can actually injure the bowel during your parasynthesis. So better to use an ultrasound guidance to uh, use. Transvaginal ultrasound scan, I would think, is still the, the best method of assessing an ovarian tumor. Um, it is again user dependent. You have to. You can do Doppler studies of the, of the vascularity of the tumor, and and it is still uh, is a very good guide 
um, particularly it, it is completely user dependent. So we use term visual scan very often. Once you have done the CT scan of the abdomen, you have to do a CCT plan. I will come to peritoneal carcinomatosis index score in my subsequent slides, but you can actually try and score a research work is now going on. One of my fellows is now doing a research on this peritoneal uh, PCI scoring based on a CT scan. And you can actually pre-assess your extent of surgery, what are the exact areas where the tumor is, what, whether you'll be able to resect it or you'll not be able to resect it uh, if you put uh, detailed information from the uh, CT scan to assess the resectability and assessment of the uh, distant metastasis. Laboratory is of paramount importance. You need to know the liver function test, the renal function test. You need to know the blood count, coagulation profile. You need to, need to know the blood group or if there's any uh, abnormal antibody. Before taking the patient to surgery, we need to check whether the patient is harboring an urinary infection. Uh, we normally do a stool surveillance culture because we do not give antibiotic to our patients in the post-operative period. But if they get infection, we know what antibiotic to treat them with. So we get the stool tested before the patients go for surgery. Um, the most important part of the entire journey is histology and associated test. In histology, of course, the, the morphological appearance of a tumor is extremely important. And I was repeatedly insisting on biopsy prior to uh, starting any treatment. Um, immunohistochemistry is very important. You should, look, you should be looking for PAX8 and, um, and WT1. These are two most important immunomarkers for ovarian, particularly ovarian cancers. Of course, for other uh, tumors, there are um, markers like um, different other immunohistochemistry markers can be used. Molecular biology is coming in, in, in a big way um, in, in ovarian cancer management as well. It is more commonly used for uh, uh, endometrial malignancy, but for ovarian cancer also, molecular biology will be uh, taking over uh, in the near future. So once you have worked up the patient in the outpatient department, then the final decision-making process should be in a multidisciplinary team meeting. Multidisciplinary team meeting is an integral part of any gynecological oncology service, and the team meeting decision is made through various guidelines you have internationally. You have national guidelines on national cancer grade, You've got other guidelines from all over the world, but when you come, when it comes to your patient, what do, you have to take a decision. Different guidelines are there to guide you only, but what you do for that patient is your decision. The, the decision should be evidence based. It should man, you should balance what are the risks that's being taken for the treatment and what are the benefits we're getting. The risks should outweigh the benefit. Uh, sorry, the, the benefits should outweigh the risks, and then only we should put in whatever treatment you've decided. It, that means your patient is first. You take, keep the patient first. If you think this is my Okay, so you decide what is the best for your patient and then uh, take the decision. There is no harm in actually revisiting. Sometimes a decision is taken in the multidisciplinary meeting, but when you, as a clinician, the primary treating clinician, you thought that this, that decision was not right. You collect evidence, you gather evidence, you revisit the patient's details and bring the patient back to your MDT to convince your, your teammates that this is what I have thought and this is the reason what I have thought. And then you take the decision again. So revisiting in an MDT is again an, an important part of the uh, decision making process. Once the decision has been taken, yes, this patient can be taken up for surgery or for new adjuvant chemotherapy, which will you do. First of all, um, before treatment, the patient should be fit. So the patient's performance status or ECOG score should be good enough. So, and, and for that, you need to have prehabilitation. The pre-anesthesia clinic is, is designed to, um, to look after patients, to make sure that they're fit for surgery. There could be medical reviews, as I said earlier, these patients are elderly patients. They can have diabetes, hypertension, and so many other comorbidities that should be addressed. In the prehabilitation part, it takes about two weeks to three weeks before the, our, our patients are actually fit for the surgery that we have proposed to do. The nutritionally should be well. Um, we normally proposing if they are non-vegetarian to take at least um, four eggs a day, a small frequent feeds because they cannot eat properly. So small frequent feeds are very important. They will be sent to the chest physio to, to the physiotherapist for. Uh, uh, teaching them how to do chest physiotherapy themselves in, with incentive spirometer, breathing exercises, pranayama is very useful for them. 
If they have comorbidities, you have to address that. Blood sugar should be brought under control. Blood pressure should be brought under control. And some of the patients will need psycho-oncology referral as well. Because no, we do not um, hide to our patients that they have cancer. We always tell our patients that, yes, this is what we are dealing with. So you have cancer, and that's how we are going to fight. We are your partner in, in this battle. And sometimes they need a referral to psycho-oncology because um, the, 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 the fear factor, the anxiety factor, can actually have effect on the treatment that we have. So once a patient is fit, we are taking them for cytoreductive surgery. Okay. So previously, um, when we planned cytoreduction, we divided them into three types. We said uh, we need uh, optimum cytoreduction that is less than one centimeter as largest diameter of each residual tumor. That was uh, proposed in GOG in 2011. Um, optimal cytoreduction and then suboptimal cytoreduction means Suboptimum cycle reduction means the tumor is more than one centimeter. And of course, complete cycle reduction is no visible residual disease or R0 resection. But now we prefer to do it in a, in a, in a different way. This is based on Sugar Baker's uh, um, surgical completion surgery score, or we call it CC score, completion of cycle reduction. So CC0 means there's no visible residual disease. CC1 is there's a serial tumor that deposits are less than 2.5 millimeters in, the, in diameter. CC2, when the residual tumor deposit is between 2.5 millimeters and 2.5 centimeters, and if it is more than 2.5 centimeters in size, the serial disease we call it a CC3. And our aim is to achieve during surgery and achieve a CC0, if not at least a CC1. That means I'm leaving, if I have to leave behind disease, I'm not going to leave behind disease anything bigger than the size of a, um, of, a, of a mustard grain. Now the problem with site reduction, it is not easy. Um, of course, the patients do not like the pain. It's scary, it's, it's huge. Of course, we have, we have to explain what the things we are doing. It's not just we come to my hospital, I'm taking a boil out of your, of, of your finger. It's, it's a huge surgery, eight to 10 hours long duration. So you have to take the patient into confidence. Um, there's always a misunderstanding or misbelief that surgery causes cancer to spread. And sometimes that is the biggest task we, we face to convince our patients that yes, surgery is the treatment for the management for, for ovarian cancer. Of course, even with doctors, many doctors believe that chemotherapy is a treatment for ovarian cancer. It is not, it's only an adjuvant. Primary treatment of ovarian cancer is surgery. So we have to also train our doctors that the treatment of ovarian cancer is surgery and chemotherapy is only in the children. And if I'm not trained to undertake such operation, then I should not be doing this operation. I should be sent to a center where this operation can be done appropriately. So these are the things that, that the, the constraint we face in, in treating and deciding on surgery of these patients. There's enough evidence in literature, I'm dating it back to 1994. Uh, Hoskins first showed that if I reduce the tumor to zero, then you can see the top part of the, of the graph, the survival uh, there and the survival here, if the disease is more than two centimeters of disease, is hugely different. Subsequently, LAT, uh, about 10 years later, exactly the same graph. If you have removed complete disease, the, the survival is, is far more than 50%, um, more, uh, five years survival, and it, it plummets uh, quickly if you are leaving behind any disease. It also depends on who's, the, who's doing the operation. If a person, if the surgeon is trained to undertake, this is again, the, I'm taking it from Alex's um, literature, more than uh, 10 years, more, more than a decade old, um, but it's still, it's very, very um, important till now. If a surgeon is doing these operations regularly, his or her uh, team outcome will be a lot different, a lot better than com compared to somebody who's not doing this surgery. So it is therefore important that Regional centers are developed, uh, are built to treat ovarian cancer, and expertise is concentrated on one area. Referral is made so that we can give the best to our women. It's not just I do a little bit of surgery, I've removed 80% of a disease, it does not really matter. You have not done any good to your patient unless and until you actually achieve a CC0 or um, CC1 at the most. This is a very interesting study. Raj Naik's team actually published this in the Cochrane Review um, from uh, Gateshead. Uh, 
of course, we all knew uh, that um, optimum cycle reduction versus suboptimum, there is a huge difference. Of course, the, the, the hazard ratio is 1.36. Uh, if you are doing optimum versus suboptimum side reduction. So less than one centimeter, more than one centimeter is a disease. We all knew about that. But what is interesting is that if the disease was more than one centimeter, and if you have achieved a CC0, zero, zero residual disease, then the hazard ratio is three. We are three times more likely to succumb to the disease if your, your, your residual disease is more than one centimeter. Furthermore, Another interesting part of this study is that now if I compare the previously that why we have moved from this previous uh, classification of optimum and suboptimum cycle reduction to the CC score, because if I am dying to compared to zero, no residual disease, then also the hazard ratio is two. So achieving a CC zero is far superior than achieving a optimum site reduction. Optimum is actually not optimum. It is suboptimum if, if you, if you uh, look at this literature as an evidence. Our aim should be to achieve a complete site reduction or a CC0. Now this is a very big issue of PDS and IDS. A lot of debate, a lot of um, agreement and disagreement. I would rather like to keep shut on this. Uh, every doctor will have their own opinion. Uh, I personally prefer a primary developing surgery if I can. There are reasons behind it, um, but if, if anyway, others can disagree with me, but um, I'm not going to go into details of that. I think the most important bottom line uh, for this is that we have to select our cases appropriately. The reason why we do um, un injustice to our patients for uh, with PDS or IDS, if I'm not appropriately selecting the patients, if I'm um, doing an IDS for a patient who could have a um, PDS in the first place, I'm probably reducing her survival. In, on the other hand, if I'm trying to do a very heroic surgery in a patient who is uh, uh, apparently unsectable, I'm just going to show off my ability to do a surgery and the patient uh, is unable to uh, receive chemotherapy within the first three weeks of her surgery, then actually I'm not doing any, any good to the patient. So case selection is, is extremely important. Leaving that aside, when I'm planning surgery, what we need to consider. If the woman, whether the woman is desirous of fertility or femininity preservation. So if I have to remove both the ovaries, I can still preserve the uterus. If I can remove one ovary, the other ovary is normal. Looking at the, at the, at the biology of the disease, the age of the patient, heart wish, I can actually preserve the other ovary and the uterus. Uterus is a victim, it's not the cause of a disease. Of course, if there are genetic predisposing factors, if the patient is known to have familial ovarian, uh, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, other things, then you can uh, consider removing the uterus in a young age. But generally, uh, over uterus, if it is not involved directly by the cancer, uh, it, it can be preserved, especially in young women. If, if, uh, other ovary, if it is also involved, but you can still preserve her femininity by giving her hormone replacement therapy, she can get rid of the periods. Uh, we need to have a histological diagnosis. In uh, some cases, we don't, uh, especially if you're planning for a um, laboratory frozen and proceed. If you think there's no extra ovarian disease, please, please, please do not poke, the, poke that uh, tumor. Because the moment you are poking the tumor, you are making uh, um, a stage 1A disease to stage 1C. So you are actually um, putting her at a risk of receiving uh, chemotherapy afterwards. If you can remove a, a, a low-grade disease intact, without rupturing, without making any hole in it, uh, uh, which, which will become stage 1a, you may avoid doing giving chemotherapy to this patient. So if you are, um, if there's no disease in the in the peritoneal cavity, then uh, don't poke the, poke the tumor, um, go for laboratory frozen procedure. So we have to have a histological diagnosis. Again, it's important, as I said earlier, to assess whether the tumor can be resected to CC0. Hand on heart, you have to say that, yes, I can remove the tumor. Only then you proceed for primary surgery. Even for interval development surgery, you have to make sure that you completely reduce, so reduce the, the whole tumor. There may be additional procedures necessary. I'll come to that in my subsequent slides. But if you think additional procedures are necessary, you have to be prepared for that. So that's how we take the patient, start surgery. It starts from planning. Um, we have made the um, plan in the, in, in the, in the uh, pre-operative sessions. 
uh, patients are given epidural to start with or post-operative analgesia, they will have a central line, a three-way line is normally given, uh, which is again, not only for the uh, 10 hours long surgery, but also in the post-operative period, they're very handy. You have to monitor the patient's blood pressure through an arterial line, um, it's, it's mandatory for all our patients. After the uh, initial and anesthetic preparation, patient will be positioned. There will be uh, an elaborate layout in the operating theater. Uh, we have to maintain the patient's temperature through um, covering the patient and, and, and different um, devices, which um, keeps the patient warm during surgery. Um, prophylactic antibiotic we give during, uh, at, the, at the start at time of induction of anesthesia, um, various combinations. At the moment we are using um, augmentin and amikacin, um, and it's, the, the augmentin is repeated after four hours, and if the surgery continues in another four hours. That's all that we use for, uh, for antibiotic. Um, it is good to have a drawing board on your, on your, in your operating theater, and we can plan and, and uh, recreate what you have decided about the surgery when you are taking the patient up for surgery. But, talking to you about the, uh, the temperature control. So uh, patient, uh, we normally do not prefer this way of keeping the patient because in, uh, we do not get access to the perineum if we prepare the patient like this. We prefer a modified Lloyd Davis position where the patient is actually kept warm in the same position, but the legs apart. The, the, the thighs are straight, knees are flexed, and patient is covered all around so the temperature is properly maintained and patient is also covered. We now also use a pneumatic compression device on the legs. The incision is uh, generally um, from symphysis previous to the sternum. So it's a, it's a midline incision. If you are doing a surgery for ovarian tumor, please think of, if you're thinking that it, it needs, I mean, it could be malignant, do not give a financial incision. Because you, need, you may need to extend the incision, you need to have an access to the, um, the greater curvature of the stomach, you need to have the access to the diaphragm. You cannot do that through a financial incision. Um, patient's life, again, is more important than an ugly scar in the, in the abdomen of the woman. So uh, you may need an incision. Sometimes you have to cut the his sternum to get access to the, uh, to the diaphragm more appropriately. So, and, and, and very occasionally, if you are planning to um, recite disease of the liver, then this type of bizarre incisions are sometimes, uh, sometimes taken. Um, but again, these are not routine practice. A single midline incision is important, is, is the way we go. Before we start the surgery, it is very important to have a good retraction. You need to have a self-retaining retractor. This is a book Walter retractor we are using. You can have Omnitract and other uh, various um, retraction devices are used. And that's how you get a very good access to the entire abdominal cavity from the diaphragm to the synth uh, synthesis pubis. Once you've exposed the patient, then you go towards um, to, uh, over the peritoneal carcinomatosis index. You assess each and every corner. This is, this is designed by Paul Sugarbaker's team. So the entire abdomen is divided into 13 different compartments and they are given a score. So LS, um, lesion size zero means no tumor, lesion size three means no tumor size more than five centimeters. So and that's how you score the entire abdomen once you have opened it. So you start from the upper part of the abdomen, you see this disease, uh, on the, the diaphragm, disease going into the upper, uh, in, into the falciform ligament, um, in, in, into the liver, plenty of disease in, uh, all around the peritoneal cavity. You look at the undersurface of the liver, especially the caudate lobe of the liver, because these are hidden areas. If you do not look for it, you do not find it. Uh, so you have to really, really look where the disease is. Um, the lesser, lesser sac uh, uh, is, is also important area where we sometimes miss. And occasionally we use the laparoscope to have a look at areas, hidden areas, where we also find diseases. So if I am not looking for it, if I'm not systematically um, looking at each and every corner of the abdomen, I may not be able to find a disease and leave brain disease. I will not achieve. I will think I have achieved C60, but actual fact, I will not achieve. So all these diseases I have seen, I'll have to remove. You have to inspect the spleen very carefully. If there's a disease that needs to be removed, inspect the entire uh, small bowel, the mesentery, the serosa. And sometimes, of course, the bowel can be involved with the tumor. Trust me, this the, this, the, the organ I'm holding here with this um, big shepherd um, forceps is actually uterus. So going into the pelvis sometimes is almost a nightmare. You do not recognize what you're looking at. 
very, very slowly and steadily get the tumor out. The first thing we start, of course, you can take the tumor, big tumor out first. Remember when you are removing the big ovarian tumor that the, 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 the ovarian, the IP ligament, the vessels, the ovarian vessels could be bigger than the uh, the inferior vena cava, extremely vascular, so you have to be careful removing that. Once you have removed the, ut of the uterus, then you can go to the upper abdomen, you strip the entire diaphragm, you can see the liver here, and the entire diaphragm is stripped of the same patient which we saw before. So how it looked at that time, and now once you have removed the entire peritoneum, it looks completely different. Entire parietal peritoneum should be taken out, the, the, the paracolic gutters should be free from any disease, then you go to the, uh, the, the small bowel, the, all the disease in the small bowel mesentery. You can use argon plasma coagulation, diathermy, you can strip it off, whichever you prefer, but you have to handle the disease, you have to treat the disease, you cannot leave behind. There's a tumor that, we, uh, that I showed you in, in, in my previous slide that enter the uterus, this, this clamp is actually placed on the rectum. So the rectum, the uterus, everything all conglomerated and you have to take it intact. So what we, end up with is called a posterior exenter after the posterior exenteration the, the entire pelvis should be empty like this you may sometimes have to reset the diaphragm um, if the, especially it happens in cases of uh, in interval development surgery because when you give them chemotherapy the disease becomes more sticky and it may be difficult to strip it of the diaphragm but you cannot leave behind disease you have to reset part of the diaphragm you can see the lungs through it once you have taken it off you have to of course suture it properly Part of the liver can be resected. Uh, it's, a, it's a small area that was resected. Uh, of course, we take help. We do not do it ourselves. We take help from our um, liver surgeons to come and do the liver resection for us. It's a very specialized area. It's not everybody's and not our uh, daily routine surgery. Um, pancreas, tail of pancreas, and um, the spleen can uh, sometimes be involved. So you can see disease at the at the hilum of the of the. Uh, spleen and at the tail of pancreas, and again, um, that, that has to be resected if there is disease. We cannot leave that behind. Lymph node dissection in ovarian cancers become rare nowadays. Uh, um, we will only do it if there are bulky disease or if it's an early ovarian cancer I'm dealing with. In early ovarian cancer, it's, patients will be upstage in about 25% of the cases. And you may find disease in the pelvic or the periodic lymph node. So in the pelvic lymph node, this section, you must be able to see the entire um, you must be able to see the entire uh, operator nerve very clearly, the, the internal iliac and the vessels, and, and periodic lymph node dissection, you should see from the ureter to the ureter uh, laterally, and the, uh, and the renal veins on the, on the superior, uh, on the, on, on the uh, cranial end. And the entire area should be uh, dissected free of the tumor. Just going briefly about HIPEC, hypothalamic intraperitoneal chemotherapy, it's a new um, it's a hyperthermia along with uh, chemotherapy that is actually uh, making the difference. We, would, we are using it only after interval uh, during interval development surgery. The role of HIPEC in primary surgery is still not proven, so we are not using it anymore, uh, not using it uh, at all. Uh, so after interval development surgery, we have done a complete site reduction, there's no residual disease, and then the patients will be um, anchored, the, the skin will be anchored with the uh, anterior anti abdominal wall, uh, wall with, with the, the retractor and the chemotherapy will be uh, will be provided. Now the calculation of the dose is done before, so um, basal um, body body surface area is calculated and on the body surface area times 100 is the milligram of cisplatin that we use and uh, times two is the perfusion volume. So 50% of a dose is given initially, and then another 25% after 30 minutes, another 25% after 60 minutes, total 90 minutes of um, treatment is given. So we have a um, hypothermic pump, and there are um, temperature sensors, which will actually give you the different temperatures at different, at different levels of the patient's body. And we have to try and maintain a temperature of 42 degrees Celsius. We have to keep the patient cool during this treatment because hyperthermia can cause brain damage. So we have to keep the patient um, brain with uh, packed with ice, ice packs uh, while we do the treatment in the abdomen. So the entire, this is the system which is outside, which is produced with the pumping fluid uh, uh, in the abdominal cavity, measuring temperature at this time 
uh, draining the fluid out. So it's like a circulation uh, from the machine outside and the abdomen inside. And that's how the surgeons who are actually operating on the patient will be um, like, like cooking kitchen um, in, in, your, in your kitchen. So constantly moving the fluid inside the abdomen so that the bowel, entire bowel gets the treatment. So that's all about the surgery. I've tried to be, um, just give you the highlights of what, what is being done. And after this type of major psychiatric surgery, patient will be need to, uh, recovered in the um, high dependency or the intensive care unit. Now, um, again, it's, it's a very important part. It's not important to do the surgery. You have to send the patients home um, well. So intensive care is, is a very, very integral part of these type of operations. You have to hand over, once you have completed the surgery, hand over to the intensive, intensive team that this is the, what has been done. These are the critical steps. This is, the, this is what the uh, blood loss was, fluid loss was. Hmm? Some of the patients will need overnight ventilation because they are not strong enough to breathe on their own. Um, they should not be complaining of any pain. So adequate analgesia, as I, as I showed you before, that we start with uh, preoperatively with the uh, epidural analgesia that is continued and um, opioids are also used as and when necessary. Um, the patient should be kept hemodynamically stable. Fluid and electrolyte balance is most important. And we also continue with that thromboprophylaxis. As I said previously, thromboprophylaxis, we um, prefer the patient is um, taken to theater on the night before. They're given uh, low molecular weight heparin. Uh, during the theater time, they're given a pneumatic compression device. In the post-operative period, the pneumatic compression device continues. And we also start um, low molecular weight heparin in the next uh, 24 hours. Then we slowly step down. Patient normally stays in the ICU for one or two days. Uh, we are very, very aggressive in, in stepping down because we want the patient to mobilize. I would want to see if the patient is not ventilated overnight. Next morning round, by eight o'clock, the patient should be sitting on the chair and blowing on their uh, instant dysphytometry. The nurses will have my peace of mind if they don't do that. It's extremely important. Patients mobilize early. They are um, aggressively managed in the post operative period. Physiotherapy, my fellows are instructed to go pitai of the patients thorough thumping of the back, make sure they cough. You know, and, and so the, 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 I, I, can, I can handle any problem in the abdomen, but I cannot handle if there's a problem in the, in the lungs. So you know, it starts with prehabilitation, and even in the post-operative period, we pay a lot of attention so the patient doesn't get pneumonia, they cough properly, they breathe properly, and analgesia is extremely important in that regard. Patient should be uh, new, given appropriate nutrition. If the patient is in the ICU for a prolonged period of time, um, we prefer enteric nutrition, but sometimes we have to give uh, parenteral nutrition for this patient. Nursing team is an integral part. They play a real vital role because we see the patients only once in the morning, once in the afternoon, once in the evening, maybe at the most three times a day. The entire time of this patient's recovery, nursing care is extremely important. So how that is how my patients will go home. When they go home, then they will come back for adjuvant chemotherapy and follow up. So the, the management of ovarian cancer is a long journey, starting from when they come to us, then they come for um, complete their surgery, they come for chemotherapy, and then we continue to do their follow up. So after the operant surgery, we normally give, it's a protocol to give paclitaxel and carboplatin. And if we have not been able to remove any, uh, any is, is a, is a disease, so if you have been, if there was CC2 or CC3 uh, after a surgery, then bevacizumab is added. Normally, if you, if you have achieved CC0, we'll not do, give bevacizumab. In new adjuvant chemotherapy setting, we normally give three cycles of paclitaxel or carboplatin. Occasionally, it can extend to the fourth cycle. If there are logistic issues, we cannot give a date to the patient. So we extend, we book a patient date and, and give one more cycle. Bevacizumab is added if the patient can afford to continue bevacizumab treatment as a, as a maintenance therapy in the, future, in, in, in the future after treatment. It's an additional six, seven lakhs of rupees of uh, that cost. So, so not everybody can afford that treatment. If they can, then we add bevacizumab. But we omit that bevacizumab uh, prior to their surgery. So for three cycles, we'll give two cycles of practically carbo and bev. In the third cycle, we'll omit bev because after bevacizumab, we cannot do surgery for about six weeks. So that gives them enough time for the patient to recover from bev. And once he has recovered, we start bev once again. 
Maintenance treatment, there's not much evidence about maintenance treatment with the conventional drugs, so we, we don't use them anymore. Um, bevacizumab, the anti-VEGF, uh, improves the PFS for a few months, but there's no change in overall survival. Um, it is probably in the subset of patients where there is residual disease, um, bevacizumab may be useful. Of course, PARP inhibitors, it's a completely a new discussion, separate discussion. Um, I'm, I'm just touching on it, not going into details of it, but that is probably going to revolutionize the way we treat ovarian cancer patients. It has seen a huge, huge difference, made a huge, huge difference. It's prohibitively exp expensive at the moment. We are only using PARP inhibitors for patients who, um, are, who are entering into some trials. Uh, we are undertaking some phase four trials at our institution. So some patients are receiving PARP inhibitors mm -hmm. at our institution. For follow-up, the protocol is that we see them once every three months for two years. Um, they need a thorough clinical examination and tumor markers. See, I want to have, of course, most common, but of course, depending on the, what the previous tumor marker was, you you, to you, to you, um, you give the you, you prescribe the tumor markers for them. CT thorax and whole abdomen is not done routinely. You do it only if the the symptoms. If there is a clinical suspicion of a recurrence, you will feel a mass in the abdomen. During your clinical session, you feel a mass in the pouch of Douglas, or if there is increasing tumor. Same protocol, we do not do imaging, but on clinical examination and tumor markers only. After five years, we see them once every year. But of course, all patients are told that if you have any symptoms anytime during your follow-up period, do not wait for your next follow-up appointment. Just come and see us. We'll see them on, on any symptom they have um, for follow-up. So you understand this, this is not one person's job. It's not one gynecologist or one person, uh, one team's job. It, multiple, multiple teams are involved in the management of ovarian cancer. You have the gynecologist, you have the medical oncologist, anesthetists, uh, GI hepatopilary surgeon, urology. Um, we have um, our investigational uh, colleagues in, in radiology, histopathology, and microbiology. And of course, we have our medical support service like intensive care, GN medicine, endocrinology, nutritionists, cardiologists, pulmonologists, psychologists. And of course, uh, these patients will need input from the transfusion medicine departments. So some of the patients will need many, many new sub blood transfusion. When we treat ovarian cancer, it is a cat and mouse chase, and this is going on forever and ever. We think we are just there, we are about to catch the mouse, and finally we end up like this, that the mouse is sitting on our head. Um, ovarian cancer is very difficult, very frustrating to, frustrating to treat, but there are patients who get cured, there are patients, if we treat them appropriately, if we treat them with compassion and empathy, we can, we can actually do some good to them. So in conclusion, as I said before, surgery is a treatment for ovarian cancer. It's the primary treatment. Chemotherapy is only adjuvant. What is needed? Of course, you need the infrastructure. You need a fantastic teamwork. And over and, uh, above everything, you need training. Proper training to do this type of surgery. It, it doesn't happen in a day. It takes decades of training to, be, to perfect your, your way of, of treating these patients um, involved in the team. So what is insurmountable at one stage, uh, at, one, uh, at one time, can become... Uh, surmountable if we, if we work together and carry the um, carry the baton forward. Thank you, everybody, for staying awake and listening to me. Well, take any wonderful um, talk, Dr. Uh, Jaydeep Bhumik. And um, I mean, it was a very wonderful lecture in the sense I can say that you have covered up all the topics. I think you haven't left any topic unturned, and unturned because um, what you are talking about the recurrence. I took to take another day. <laughs> so I just yeah, but then that's okay. But then the way you have covered up all the, this shows you are a wonderful teacher, and uh, yes, your patients are very lucky to be under your guidance is one thing which I'm understanding, and um, you have covered up all these studies, and uh, you have put up your own other uh, possible algorithm which has said that genetic uh, testing would be the first priority. So all these things um, are very good. And then um, the surgical management, high tech and everything which you have covered up and the medical management up and all that, it's excellent, I think. Okay, uh, so uh, good evening, all of you. Uh, so uh, at the beginning, I would like to thank the MP chapter of AGOI, especially Dr. Yashodra Gaurman for, uh, for uh, 
inviting me. Uh, my topic is revisiting the role of uh, radiotherapy in ovarian cancers. And at the beginning, let me tell you that I have not treated any ovarian cancer patient in past 12 years. When I am treat, I am saying uh, radiated, it means primary radiation. I have treated metastatic patients, but as such, no ovarian patients come to us. And in fact, this was made very clear in uh, the, uh, in Vomixer's uh, presentation that ovarian cancer basically today is, is the disease for surgeon. And for adjuvant uh, therapy, now we are having chemotherapy. But still, why, when this topic was given to me, it, uh, it, you know, it created a lot of questions in my mind. Yeah, I know, the, I know uh, one basic thing that we do not treat ovary anymore because of the toxicities we experienced in past. But what actually went wrong? So in this presentation, in the coming slides, I will try to in, uh, show you the data, what we have. We talk, of, uh, talk about radiotherapy in ovarian cancers and what were the things which went wrong, what is the future, uh, what could be the probable indications in future of radiotherapy in ovarian cancers. I would like to thank my friend Dr. Manish Siddha who has helped me with the scientific content. So this is a famous uh, American uh, documentary which was released in 2010 cut, poison, and burn. A very basic, uh, it, it, very, it gives the message very clearly about how to treat a cancer. Basically, three main modalities, cut means surgery, poison means to give chemotherapy, and burn means to radiate. And when we talk about solid tumors in particular, these local therapies in form of surgery and radiation, they play a vital role. Uh, but few of the solid tumors, we have now stepped down because we ultimately, we believe in science. We follow the science, we follow the evidence. And the evidence somehow is not favoring treating ovarian cancers with radiation anymore. In the past, there have been studies, there was some success also, but then there was a cost which was not acceptable. And uh, finally, uh, radiation stepped down. A brief background, uh, Sir, as uh, Sir also showed in his slides, this is the first fourth most common fatal malignancy in women. Even in early stages, 20% of the patients, they eventually fail. And in advanced diseases, most of the patients, they fail either in abdomen and pelvis. The overall survival has not changed significantly in the last three decades. There are a lot of myths also with radiation that all ovarian cancers, they have same radio responsiveness or resistance. No, it is not like that. Radiotherapy is intolerable in the doses which is necessary, uh, necessary to sterilize the disease. Uh, again, we, it's, it is just ovary. Other than that, we treat a lot of intra-abdominal malignancies. We treat a lot of hepatocellular carcinomas. We treat pancreas. And uh, we treat cervix, of course. And when we treat all these sites, a lot of bowel and a lot of other normal structures, they come in our field. And that too, when we, uh, we in, for most of the tumors, we give a very high dose but we usually don't encounter any major problems there. Radiation is too toxic to bowel. As I said, we are treating a lot of other malignancies where bowel is coming in field, but we are not encountering major bowel toxicities. Radiation cannot be given after chemotherapy. No, in many diseases, we are giving, we are using radiation after chemotherapy. And all histologies have same propensity of transperitoneal spread and thus they, they need wide field radiation. The most commonly practiced uh, radiation, which was whole abdomen radiation, we do not necessarily need whole abdomen radiation for all the tumors. Going back to history, uh, so this was in early 80s when Princess Margaret Hospital and Gynec Oncology Group, they analyzed patients, uh, of, uh, 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 patients of ovarian cancer and they analyzed pelvic radiation with observation or melphalon. And what they noticed, that uh, pelvic failures were reduced in patients, but the failures in abdomen were very high. So Dambo et al, they did a randomized study in 147 patients. The patients received pelvic radiation with or without chlorambucil and they were compared against whole abdomen radiation. And what they found that the survival with whole abdomen radiation was better than the other arm. And the benefit was more uh, pronounced in the arm where the residual disease was less. 
Files at all, they did another random, randomized study uh, in 125 patients. They compared two different dose regimes. One was 22.5 gray, other was a higher dose of 27.5 gray. And what they found at the median follow-up of 6.8 years that the uh, DFS and overall survival were almost uh, same in both the arms. There was no statistically significant difference. So they concluded that we can, uh, uh, there's no need to give a higher dose because higher dose means higher toxicity. And when we, key, when we achieve a same result in a lower dose, there's, there was no point in giving higher toxicity. There are many trials on uh, adjuvant radiotherapy in ovarian cancers. The first one, the PMS study, which I just described. The next was by Coz et al. in 2001, who randomized 150 patients, where they compared radiation versus chemotherapy with cisplatin, toxorubicin, and endoxone. Uh, six cycles, and the outcomes were comparable. But the problem was bowel toxicity, which was more in the radiation arm. Here, I would like to tell you that all these trials which have compared radiation and chemotherapy, they all, almost all of them, they were using uh, conventional radiation and the present or the modern day radiation is far ahead of the conventional radiation. The toxicities which we used to encounter then are no longer seen because now we are able to shape our beam. We can uh, spare the areas which we do not want to radiate, which was not possible with the conventional technique. The other thing was cisplatin. Actually, cisplatin was the game changer. Before cisplatin, whatever uh, chemo molecules they were used or they were compared against radiation, the trials were showing almost equivocal vocal results. But when cisplatin came into picture, the results were better and the toxicities were less. So then onward, uh, surgery and cisplatin, they ruled the ovarian uh, cancer treatment. And uh, radiation gradually uh, lost it, its crown. The many studies, and uh, this is a summary of the long-term outcomes uh, in various uh, trials. And we can see that in all the studies where the residuum was very less, the outcomes were better with radiation. There are trials which have compared chemo versus radiation. And, and as I, I was saying, that when chemotherapy and with cisplatin came into picture, things changed a lot and the outcomes were better. And at the same time, side effects were less. In the previous trials, we were getting equal. Sometimes uh, some trials are showing radiation was better. Some trials were showing chemotherapy was better. But uh, after cisplatin, most of the trials were favoring that over polyabdomen and radiation. The trials on consolidative radiation as well, and uh, uh, in fact, there are more than 30 reports available about the use of consolidation radiation. Uh, and this was Thomas et al. They collected data of 473 patients from 28 single arm studies and concluded that 76% of patients, they were disease free at six to 10 years when there was no residuum uh, after a second look surgery versus 49% of the patients uh, with microscopic disease or disease less than five millimeter. Another study by Sorbet et al. in 2003, they evaluated 98 patients who underwent primary treatment and were randomly assigned to receive radiation, chemotherapy, or no further treatment. And what they found that the patients who received radiation, they had a better PFS and OS. Swedish Norwegian group, they evaluated 272 patients and these patients were further subdivided into two groups. One group uh, which had uh, no mic uh, microscopic disease uh, and the other group having uh, microscopic disease. And uh, uh, or observation or radiation, while the second group received uh, radiation or chemotherapy. And obviously for obvious reason, the first group, they uh, showed better results in terms of DFS. The next is an over IMRT trial. This is an important trial, particularly about radiation, and this I'll be talking about in my subsequent slides. And this is how, in most of the trial, uh, the risk model was defined and uh, uh, which category of patients they can be benefited from radiation. Uh, this is uh, how they used to uh, measure. There are a lot of trials of salvage radiotherapy as well, as uh, Madam was saying in the beginning, that platinum refractory diseases, they are common. And uh, even in these uh, patients, almost 10 to 20% of the patients, they respond to radiation. And one such study was done by Brown et al, who reviewed 102 patients, and almost one third of the patients who received IFRT or the involved field radiation. This was not the whole abdomen radiation. This was 
radiation to only the involved area and the, the intention was very clear we wanted to salvage that part and uh, there was no prophylactic radiation to any part and uh, the results were quite satisfactory almost one third of the patients they went into cr the high response rate was observed in patients who were sensitive to platinum toxin who had clear cell histology another study was by yahara et al uh, they also analyzed the important uh, the role of salvage radiotherapy and they found that the pf was, was almost 40% in which salvage radiation was used palliative radiotherapy when we talk about palliation we know that many of the patients they will fail almost 66% of the patient they will recur or metastasize so once a study was done by foxes where they treated 33 patients uh, with palliative radiation and what they found that almost half of the patient they had complete palliative response and overall almost 80% patient had some degree of response uh, when we talk about palliation of uh, symptoms like bleeding or pain when we talk about histology uh, as we know that ovarian cancer they are now represented by various histological subtypes depending on various biological and molecular characteristics clear cell mucinous and endometrial variants they are they are considered chemo, chemo resistant now we are having any more molecules and maybe in near future we will have some better molecules to treat these uh, diseases as well but uh, one study was uh, done but by nagai et al in, in 96 and 2004 in 16 patients who had clear cell histology uh, and the patients they received pelvic radiation uh, and the uh, whole abdomen as well as the pelvic radiation where uh, pelvis received the radiation boost uh, almost all the patients except one they completed the treatment but two, two patients they required bowel surgery with a five year overall survival uh, and uh, disease free survival 81.8% and 33% another study was done by british columbia group where uh, they analyzed this was a retrospective study they analyzed 241 patients uh, clear cell variant, variant and they underwent surgery and Uh, they were given three cycles of paclitaxel carboplatin 111 patients they received chemotherapy by physician physician's choice we are resonated three three patients they underwent radiation and what they found that uh, in patients with stage 1c and who were cytologic positive the dfs was significantly improved cobell et al they analyzed stage distribution and they observed that majority of serous cell histology they were advanced stages and clear cell variant they were lower staged and 90% of the clear cell endometrial and mucinous they were confined to pelvis and local treatment in form of radiotherapy could be beneficial in these patients and you not you need not to cover the entire abdomen in these patients talking about the techniques so this was these were the techniques which were used in most of the previous studies the target was the entire abdomen but the problem was that that was a blind radiation if you are treating an entire uh, abdomen uh, at that time there were no such good mortality modalities to spare the at least the involved liver kidney or the bone marrow and this is a classical moving moving strip technique which was used in past where the whole abdomen was divided into multiple strips and one strip used to get radiation in a day the entire therapy used to last for one one and a half month and the problem was toxicity these were the machines most of, most of them were cobalt machines who were utilized uh, in those studies but now just like uh, the other modalities have evolved radiation has evolved a lot we are no more in the 2d era which was uh, 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 the 2d technique which was utilized earlier now we have uh, the 2d uh, then came the 3d technique when we utilized multiple beams to shape according to the uh, size of the tumor and the shape of the tumor and we are having very advanced techniques like imrt and rapid arc now by which we can shape our beam according to the shape of the tumor and we can spare our uh, normal structures and we can hit our targets uh, in a much better way than we were doing previously so now we are into the era of next generation radiation and once a study was done by rochet and colleague where they examined the next uh, the modern radiation this was just a single arm study the phase 1 portion of the study they treated 16 women uh, all of them they received optimal primary resection 
with less than one centimeter residual disease. This was followed by six cycles of carboplatin and docetaxel. And then uh, consolidation radiation was given with either static beam or helical uh, tomotherapy in a dose of 30 grain, 20 fractions. All these patients, they completed the plant treatment and there was no grade four toxicities. The results were promising with four year of follow-up, there have been relatively low rates of uh, early severe toxicity. Though late toxicities, they in, it included six small bowel obstruction, but of those six, three were because of the tumor recurrence. The recurrence free survival was 27.6 months and the median overall survival was 42.1 months. So these results, they prompted for an over IMRT2 study. This is an ongoing study. Uh, uh, they're they're in, enrolling 37 patients with optimally cyto, uh, reduced stage three ovarian cancer. The clinically complete remission after chemotherapy, they will be treated with IMR uh, intensity modulated full abdomen radiation uh, as a, con, as a consolidation, uh, consolidation therapy. The primary endpoint is tolerability and the secondary objectives are toxicity, quality of life, progression free and overall survival. So here, just a diagram of uh, how the conventional and conformal uh, radiation is different. The upper three pictures, they depict the conventional radiation while the lower three pictures, they are from a conventional plan, more or less, they look same. But the graph in this picture, it, 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 it tells a different story. So the shaded or the, the broken lines which you are seeing, this is, this is the graph which, which tells actually about the quality of plan. We call it dose volume histogram, what structure is getting what dose. So the red area is usually our target and we want to give a very high dose to that area. So when we see the dotted red line, uh, which is the radiation dose given by the, the, the IMRT plan, the coverage is very good. It means our target is getting a very good dose in an IMRT plan, while in conventional plan, the coverage is not that good. When we look at the other uh, structures, like normal structures, which, which comes in our field, like liver, kidney, and bone marrow, they are getting a very high dose in the conventional plan, but a uh, very acceptable dose in the IMRT plan. So that is the importance of uh, using an IMRT or the modern radiation. So nowadays, when we treat a whole abdomen, the picture looks somewhere, somewhat like this, that we can, we just treat uh, the rim of uh, rim around the liver, rim around the kidneys, and we can avoid a lot of volume. And volume, basically, if you are avoiding volume, we are avoiding toxicities. So these are the kind of machines and equipments we are having now, which are capable of delivering very high precise radiation to the desired areas. And thus, that the major advantage of these uh, technical advances is that we can improve the quality of life by sparing the normal tissues. This is the biggest advantage we are having now, which was not there previously. Another uh, modality uh, or, or, or a kind of radiation, SBRT or stereotactic body radiotherapy, where we give a very high dose of radiation. This has been uh, studied widely in, in uh, particularly in recurrent and metastatic ovarian cancer, uh, where an isolated uh, or oligometastatic lesion, two or three numbers, they can be given a very high dose of radiation and they can, uh, uh, if they are not surgically salvageable, if, if surgery is possible and a surgeon is willing to do, the results are uh, almost comparable. In many of the other subsites, not ovary, I'm not talking about ovary in particular, but in many of the other subsites, SBRT is now uh, one of the preferred modality. And in ovarian, I'm sure very soon for isolated or uh, oligometastatic disease, it will establish its role. Its role. We, are, we have seen very good local control with SBRT, which, which ranges from 70 to 90% in the range of 70 to 90%. So this is the kind of dose distribution we see with SBRT. Uh, so you see, you can see in one of the image that the disease is lying very close to right kidney, but the disease is wet, getting a very high dose. And at the same time, kidney is spared and is, getting, is receiving almost a minimal dose. And thus we can avoid toxicity to all these uninvolved area, which are not related with the disease. So still why they are there, there are reasons why we, there is very limited role of RT. First, there is no randomized trial which has compared platinum or taxin-based chemotherapy to radiation. And when I'm saying radiation, it is the modern radiation, not the conventional radiation where, where the beam shaping or sparing of the normal tissues was, was not possible. Post-operative chemotherapy, this has become the standard of care worldwide, irrespective of the histology. Previous large majority of trials who underwent radiotherapy, they were serious histology with affected results. 
wide field radiation with intolerable doses is ineffective in eradicating bulky residual disease. So the probable indications for radiotherapy in ovarian cancers could be post op RT in early or intermediate stage, consolidated, uh, consolidative RT in advanced stage ovarian cancer after aggressive cytoreductive surgery, non serious serious variants, intermediate risk patients with no residual disease or less than two centimeters. Oh, which is confined to pelvis. The recurrent disease uh, confined to pelvis or palliation of symptom. Out of these, I'm, I'm very much hopeful that at least for isolated or, or oligometastatic disease, the radiation will definitely establish its role. So to conclude, ovarian cancers, they have uh, demonstrated sensitivity to radiation therapy. Toxicity in the historical settings, they, it has limited present day use of this treatment modality. However, an updated understanding of molecular differences of distinct histological subtypes of ovarian cancer with dif uh, differential response to both chemotherapy and radiation therapy, this has generated new, new renewed interest in the potential application of radiotherapy in ovarian cancer. So just uh, to conclude, we know that answers to the future, they lie in the past. We want to have a better future. We want to have a better future for our patient. We want to do good uh, to do something better for our future. We have to learn from our mistakes we have made in past so that we can deliver better for our patients in future. Thank you. If there are any questions, please ask. Yes, ma'am. Mudita? Anji, ma'am. Please help. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so one question, is there any role of prolactin in the screening of ovarian cancer? It's appearing like I'm taking my exams. <laughs> um, that, no. Back in the today, I got a patient. So she is 22 years old. She has 4.5 into 4 centimeter right how old, ovarian. How old, sorry, how old is she? So 22 years. Okay. So 4.5 into 4 centimeter ovarian mass with the uh, uh, mental nodularity with moderate ascites and uh, so that she has a history of amenorrhea since last six months or uh, six years so so just for that checkup i uh, did her uh, thyroid and prolactin with the other markers everything is normal other than her prolactin is raised it is around 400 so so that's why I'm asking, sir, her ascitic tapping cytology is negative for any malignant cells. Yeah, I think she has got tuberculosis. Okay, sir. So uh, you should test the, uh, the, the peritoneal nodules. Um, best is to do um, a gene expert. Um, okay, this is test for the, from, the, from the tissue biopsy. Uh, because it's very difficult to diagnose tuberculosis. Normally diagnosis by exclusion. But in our country, and that is why I said don't do PET scans, because these are the women where you do a PET scan and end up with peritoneal disease all over. And tuberculosis is very... So the ovary and lesion in this girl is a normal sized ovary. Up to six centimeters in a young girl will not do anything at all. Uh, but there is peritoneal nodule, and yes. there is ascites, there is amenorrhea. So all points towards the diagnosis of, of, of tuberculosis. So she should be checked for tuberculosis. So there's no association with the prolectin. It is a accidental finding. Well, or tuberculosis is a multi-system disorder, so it can have a microadenoma at the same time. Uh, uh, an endocrinologist will be better than me to answer that. But tuberculosis is associated with um, tuberculoma of the brain, a microadenoma, and this can happen. Check check for tuberculosis. I think that's the more likely diagnosis for this. So we can can we have some uh, CT scan of the uh, base of the brain for excluding this adenoma, microadenoma? It would be better. MRI would be better. MRI will be better. Yeah, to look at the brain, MRI will be better. A clinical medical trial is what is indicated. I mean, not leprotomy, is it? No, no, no. I will not do a leprotomy in this young girl. I think that I have to do a, make a diagnosis first. Take a biopsy from the omental nodule. Send the fluid for some um, TB, TB test. Wait for the cultures, probably just a granuloma. And if there's a granuloma, you can start treating her for, uh, with, with anti, anti tuberculosis drugs. It's India we're talking about, so I have to be in my own country. 
So many times we have, we have seen such cases. Uh, we see the APR says ovarian carcinoma or peritoneal carcinoma, but actually they are the cases of uh, tuberculosis, abdominal pelvic tuberculosis, and uh, they their presence is very aggressive when mm -hmm. we open them and see. Yeah. And they respond very well to the chemo uh, this uh, anti-tubercular treatment also. Yeah. Yeah. Very right, you are very really right. Yeah. Any, any other question, Mudita? Uh, yeah, ma'am. 48 year old uh, patient with CKD, uh, separated ovarian mass of 11 into 9.8 into 9.7 mm uh, centimeter, abutting uterus, bladder, rectum with no symptom. CA 125 is less than 25. What should be done now? Yeah, say that again. I missed the first part. What you said? Oh, okay, sir. Sorry. So thirty. Forty-five year old woman. Uh, Forty-eight year old woman. Known case of CKD, chronic kidney disease, large irregular complex, septated ovarian mass of around eleven into ninety-eight into ninety-seven mm, abutting uterus, bladder, rectum with no symptom. CA 125 is less than 25. What should be done now? So it, the most important part of the diagnosis is the have a look at the image of the ovary. If it's an ultrasound scan, whether you can see solid elements in that ovary, separated mass could be a, a, a salpings, a pyosalpings or hydrosalpings of a long time. It could be the, the tube rather than the ovary. So uh, it, it will have to be a very good ultrasound scan where you can see solid elements. If there are solid elements, whether that solid element is the ovary and the rest of it is the fallopian tube, that is something you have to consider. Because the tumor marker is normal in that woman, I'm thinking in those terms. Okay. That's because this is a, um, a, a, a cystic lesion of the fallopian tube rather than the, uh, rather than the ovary. Um, if, because she's a patient of chronic renal disease, so contrast enhancement and CT scan may not be very helpful. And for assessment of the ovarian mass or the pelvic mass, it is better either if you have a very good ultrasound ultrasonographer who can actually give you the exact diagnosis or you need an MRI scan. You can do a non-contrast MRI scan, T1 and T2, will give you some idea about uh, what type of uh, lesion it is. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so another question? Um, Pyosalpings, or something like that. Rather than, rather than a variant team. And they are generally bilateral, so that will also be uh, helpful in your uh, thinking. So there is one more question. ANC three months with frequent complaints of pain in abdomen with seven into seven into seven centimeter ovarian cyst. How to proceed? Again, the character of the cyst is very important because if you do tumor markers, if she's pregnant, the CA125 will be high anyway. So it will not be a very good guide to you to tell you whether this is um, whether this is any um, any tumor or just a normal functional cyst of pregnancy. So again, ultrasound scan. You have a good ultrasound scan. To look at this. Look if there are solid elements. Ovarian tumor, especially borderline ovarian tumor, uh, with pregnancy is very common. I mean, I will not say very common. It's not uncommon. So we have to think about uh, ovarian tumor, um, and we can we can watch the growth of the of the cyst. Uh, in, in, in subsequent ultrasound scans. If it is rapidly growing, of course, you have to do a surgery and take it out. Just do an ultrasound go for it for her, uh, open procedure. Um, if and only if, if you think that there are solid elements in the ovary, and if you've done a Doppler study, you can see um, increased vascularity, then only think of operation. Otherwise, just leave it alone. It can be just a functional system of pregnancy. Okay, sir. So one more question, last question for the session. Uh, what would be the management of bulky ovaries with ascites in elderly? Ascitic tap done negative from both malignant cells as well as tuber uh, tuberculosis. Very good question. Um, any elderly patient with ascites, um, of course, you should look for other causes. Ovarian cancer is one of the many, many causes of ascites. Bulky ovary doesn't mean anything to me. I need to know the exact size. I need to know the texture, the architecture, uh, the um, blood flow. Everything needs to be taken into consideration. 
She can have ascites because of cirrhosis of the liver. She can have ascites because of inflammatory bowel disease. So many different conditions can give rise to ascites. It can be stomach cancer. I mean, if you look at malignancy, it can be cancer from the stomach. It can be cancer from the pancreas, which is giving her ascites. So um, just looking at a bulky ovary, you, know, you have to look at the woman. Just do not look at the ovaries. Look at the, the woman. Look at the entire presentation. Look at the images more carefully. Uh, what is the, again, the character of the image is, is more important than anything else. And if the psychology is negative, you think of other causes of, of, of uh, ascites, like cirrhosis of the liver, um, pancreatic tumors, stomach tumor cancer, all these things are also important. Sir, is there you know, any people, role of PET scan in this type of patients? PET scan is always misleading in initial diagnosis of ovarian mass. Do not do PET scan, it will only mislead you. It will not give you any diagnosis. Sir, PET as in this case, an image. PET scan is only an image. It's a different image. It's a, it's a metabolic image. It does not give you any diagnosis. You have a misunderstanding about PET scan that it gives you a, a false sense of uh, security or insecurity, whichever you look at it, but it does not give you a diagnosis. The ultimate diagnosis is from biopsy, ultimate diagnosis from cytology. So, but the, this, in this type of cases, as, uh, as such, we can get an idea where is the uh, metabolic active. You have the same picture on tuberculosis as well. Okay, sir. Yeah. So, just to add, uh, if it is a mucinous histology, there will be no uh, FDG. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Even if over in tumor, you will not see. Uh, That's why you don't, do, don't use PET CT. Agree. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. And, sir, one more question. So, what will be the minimum cycle before IDS? interval debulking surgery, maximum, how many cycles we can give? We target three cycles. We always target three cycles. Um, if we have any logistic issues, I mean, main logistic issue because of our waiting list, we have a very long waiting list. We try to put the patients at least one, uh, one month to six weeks in advance, but still sometimes there is a problem. Uh, in that case, uh, we just give them this uh, fourth cycle and do the surgery after the fourth cycle. So suppose the tumor is not too much uh, uh, down, stay, uh, like suppressed, uh, even in the three cycles, can we give, because of these issues, can, give, can we give one, uh, one or two more cycles or it is standard we have to do after three or four cycles? It doesn't really help. It doesn't really help. The only thing that, that is useful in the surgery, again, I'm, I'm personally a proponent for primary surgery. I do not like ideas because, yes, um, again, these type of things are coming up. Surgery is actually difficult, more difficult in ideas because the tumors, if they're there, they become more sticky. Um, you will almost inevitably make a hole in the diaphragm if you're taking a strip in the diaphragm during an ideas. Um, but you know, delaying the surgery by more cycles, I don't think it uh, helps anyway in, in the patient's overall survival. So I will attempt a surgery after three or four cycles. If they, if they need more cycles and they're unlikely to um, benefit from the surgery. In the, sometimes we do get patients who have already received six, six cycles and then they come to us. Of course, we need surgery for them, but that is not our standard practice. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot, sir. I, I do have one question, sir. I have one patient of around, around 18, 20 years and uh, she was having a solid uh, ovarian tumor. She was operated and only ovarian cystectomy was done and it was come out to be immature teratoma. Uh, then uh, patient was give, uh, sent to the uh, radio onco department and they have given the treatment. And uh, But patient comes to me uh, frequently by, uh, for complaining of pain. Her ultrasonography is done, her MRI is done, there is no uh, disease is found. So uh, what else we can do for this patient, immature teratoma? So what grade was it? Uh, Did she need adjuvant yes. treatment? It was... Adjuvant treatment was given. Was given. Okay. given. So it was a uh, grade two or grade three mature teratoma, I would suppose. Yeah. See, the moment I am told that I have got cancer, my mindset changes. So I am always scared that yes, I know the cancer can come back, cancer can kill me. And one of pain is something which we cannot see; we can only feel. So it's it, it, there's a lot of counselling that needs to be done with this young girl that yes, you are actually a champion, you have defeated cancer, you can win. Pain is nothing for you. You have to learn to live with the pain. Of course, when you do surgery, there can be adhesions, so you have to make sure to um, uh, exclude uh, possible peritoneal adhesions, bowel adhesions, make sure that she is not constipated. 
uh, make sure that there is no other issues in the background. Uh, social issues can be there to uh, present as, as pelvic pain. I mean, I have, I've known girls, young girls being sexually abused and they're presenting complaints of pelvic pain. So all these things as doctors, as, as uh, uh, clinicians, as gynecologists will have to think about, especially when young women come to us with pelvic pain. So, see, I'm, I'm not thinking just as a oncologist. I'm thinking as a gynecologist and looking after a woman, not just looking at the disease. So if you think in that way, pain is very easily managed. Thank you, sir. Very right. Uh, I think uh, uh, the overall lifestyle management and uh, all these aspects must be uh, covered while counseling. It's a total approach. It's not just doing good surgery or giving fantastic chemotherapy. It's it's, uh, it's a total total approach. Holistic. Yeah. Holistic approach should be there. Yes. Ma'am, there is one more question regarding the patient we had talked, uh, the elderly patient with negative ascitic fluid. Can we start NACT? Does she have cancer? Negative cytology is there. Negative for malignant cells. Yes. Negative for malignant and Cox both. Huh. So uh, why, aren't, why aren't you planning to send her to the moon? <laughs> no, book, book a flight to the moon. <laughs> See, chemotherapy should not be given without a diagnosis of cancer. And better still, not just cancer, what type of cancer, where the cancer is. The chemotherapy for ovarian cancer is different from the chemotherapy for stomach cancer. Chemotherapy for breast cancer is different. So you just think that could be cancer and give uh, chemotherapy is absolute no, 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 and never. Uh, I want to ask one thing. Uh, generally, before operating any case of uh, solid cystic tumors of the ovaries, we get CA-125 done. So how far is this investigation reliable that uh, we will not be encountering a malignant tumor if the CA-125 values are quite low? It is helpful, but not reliable. You're absolutely not very reliable. much reliable. It is helpful, okay. but not reliable. So you can have ovarian cancers, especially clear cell carcinoma of the ovary, but the CA-125 is absolutely normal or low. And you can have uh, like a normal mucinous cyst adenoma of the ovary, not malignant ovary, with a CA-99 level of 2000. So all these things can happen. Uh, again, we have to put the entire thing into context. The woman's age, the, uh, the, the texture, the, the architecture, the vascularity of the tumor on imaging and the tumor markers. And whether you see disease outside the ovary. Uh, so everything put together. So again, I'm coming back to the same point. Treat the woman, not just the disease. Um, look at the holistic approach. How, what is the best fit of the diagnosis and treat it accordingly. Yes. So you get one CA125 does not give me any diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank oh, you. sir. Uh, just one sentence. So this was not at all like your exam, no? It was like you had another OPD, another oncology OPD. Absolutely, sir. So, yes. <laughs> so, so there is a lot of fear and anticipation and uh, like informed person. Right person with a broad knowledge base and clinical experience. Uh, next time, don't get afraid when we ask questions. <laughs> I think beautiful females are around. There should be no fear. Sorry? <laughs> so, trust me, I get questions from my patients. I encourage them to ask questions. And we were discussing just before the, um, before the start of the session about um, Baba Ram. <laughs> giving all this information. I tell you a story about a, a very a patient came in with a son with a, um, with, with a, with a laptop on, on, on his hand. And to, doctor, he did not know the latest treatment in ovarian cancer. I said, what is it? I said, Gomutra, Kali Gai Ka Gomutra. And you don't use it. I'm so sorry, I do not know about that. Please excuse me. This is beyond my knowledge and beyond my participation. So you know, questions are asked and we have to answer the questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So we come to a very interesting end of the first session of our gynecology oncology fourth webinar. Um, I invite Dr. Monica Divan. Um, yes, you will be introducing our next uh, set of chairpersons. And let me introduce you. Can I please take your leave because I have my uh, operation is going to come 
conclude now. I've got to go back to the operating theater and finish the operation. So please, you have given us a lot of time. You have uh, cleared you. every query. Thank you so much. And thank you, sir. The... I want to say something. Thank you, sir. Thanks for uh, a very excellent talk and uh, solving so many queries. And uh, definitely, it uh, has solved many uh, queries of our uh, uh, participants and this. And thanks, thanks a lot, sir. It's been my pleasure. Really, really, thanks. Thank we, we want to again to talk on uh, other topics like recurrence, like yeah. okay, sir. Thank Very you. Sir. Surely, surely, I'll participate. Sir, sir, we'll meet. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Sure. So I continue introducing Dr. Monica. I have not even begun. She is consultant at Cancer Hospital and Research Institute, Gwalior, and she has fellowship in gynae oncology. So this is uh, good for Gwalior, good for Cancer Hospital, and good for Monica. And I wish her all the best. She is joint secretary MPSC Agoy, and has been awarded the best doctor award by Youth Congress India. And she has presented. and published many papers posters participated as guest faculty and speakers a speaker in various state national and international congresses uh, of course thank like you, so many thank, thank you ma'am thanks a lot ma'am my pleasure my pleasure and all the best now to see with I'm the next i would to like yashoda gaur madam for giving me this opportunity and it is a great opportunity to see you all after such a long time bahut acha lag raha hai ma'am sabko dekhkar itna acha lag raha hai ki sab pass mein hi hai so moving ahead for our next session uh we have very energetic kusum singhal madam with us uh madam is the consultant gynecologist obstetrician infertility specialist laparoscopic surgeon director of koteshwar hospital presently ma'am uh, ma is the member of mtp committee foxy executive member of mpox senior vice president ima gwalior vice chairperson national ima culture committee joint secretary aicog 2021 member iaga and lot more we know madam is very energetic har jagah kuch na kuch special madam ka rehte hai we welcome you ma'am thank you so much monica for such kind introduction thanks a lot uh, next year person the next year person is dr mudita jain she is professor ops and gynecology presents presently secretary is uh, secretary of bhopal ops and gyne society past treasurer of bhopal ops and gyne society 2019 and 20 there's lot more for the mudita but mudita is very cute very nice soft spoken <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much didi i would like to thank uh, yashura gaur ma'am sir for inviting me as chair person in this society though i am born as in carrier from gwalior and i had learned a lot from all of you and in fact monica di was my senior resident when i was doing my last year pg so i had learned a lot from monica di also Thank and gaur madam was just like a mother figure who has taught everything beaten us also no sometimes i don't know what happened <laughs> no no aise allegations mat lagao no allegations yashodra can never beat she was she was a leader of pgs and she was the right time mother she has corrected at every uh, term on our life Mudita was not only our PG; she was my hostel prefect, and I remember that we organized a uh, New Year uh, party, and she went to the mall, <laughs> leaving behind that party. And <laughs> I was the naughtiest PG during Madam Tanya, <laughs> but hardworking also. Yes, lively uh, and very uh, keen to learn. Uh, yeah, so very. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. This is the only incident you remember. I went to the New Year party to see three idiots. Oh no! Shall we still continue? Continue? Continue, ma'am. I'm so sorry. So now I hand over my to our chairperson of this sessions. Please. Yeah. Uh, can I? Yeah. Can I get the? CV of our speaker. 
So it is my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. Deepthi Gupta. She, uh, is she here? Is she yes, ma'am. I'm right here. here. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Deepthi. She Thank is, you, ma'am. Uh, yeah, she has done a graduation from uh, Mumbai and post-graduation from GRMC Gwalior, very much from our own city. Yes, uh, currently, she is assistant professor in the Department of Gynops, NSCB, Jabalpur. And she is consultant and unit head Ankur Fertility, Fertility Clinic, Jabalpur. Previously, also, she was assistant professor at Bhopal. She was reviewer, journal of evaluation, medical and dental sciences. She was faculty, she is faculty at ISAR, MPCG, Raipur, and many more associations. She has got uh, uh, many uh, publications to uh, her uh, CV. Uh, posts which have been held in past are joint secretary, infertility committee chairperson, editor of uh, many journals like Jobs, joint treasurer and treasurer Jobs, and uh, her interests mean uh, special interest in reading, sketching, and doodling. So, wow, apart from being gynec, you are a multi talented person having uh, interest in other things also. So, I welcome Dr. Deepthi. Uh, Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, you can please start your talk on uh, PCOS. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so uh, at the outset, I'm extremely grateful to Yashudra Gaur, ma'am, for giving me this opportunity. And honestly, I'm quite nervous. Uh, I am the one who's feeling like a student giving viva in front of my revered teachers. And it's an extreme honor for me to be speaking in front of uh, my teachers, uh, like uh, Joshi, ma'am, Gaur, ma'am, Tripathi, ma'am, and Kavita Singh, ma'am. And uh, my talk might seem like the odd duck and it is the last talk of the evening, but I hope I can do justice and see if uh, we can fit in. So, uh, uh, a little bit about the background. Historically, for uh, times immemorial, we have regarded Steen and Leventhal as discoverers of PCOS, and rightly so. However, uh, the reference of PCOS can be found in literature as uh, back as uh, 300 to 400 BC. And it has been referred to by various names, for example, polycystic ovaries disorder, functional ovary androgenism, hyperandrogenic chronic anovulation, ovarian dysmetabolic syndrome, sclerotic polycystic ovary syndrome, etc. The first paper was published on PCOS in 1935, 85 years down the line, and it still remains an enigma and baffles us till date. The formal diagnostic criteria was first proposed in 1990, which was almost three decades ago, and the Rotterdam criteria, which is still the most established and used criteria, was proposed in 2003. Needless to say, it is a multifactorial, commonest endocrinopathy in women. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have exact figures on prevalence. There are various studies uh, reporting a wide range of prevalence from 3.7 to 22.5% uh, across India. Infertility obviously is quite common, affecting about 40% of women with PCOS. And uh, if we talk about the women with ovulatory factor, then as much as 90% of that group belongs to PCOS. Clearly, it is not a one-point disease. Uh, these women will present to us in adolescence with maybe hyperandronism, uh, oligo or inovulation, high, uh, obesity. They will come to us in the peak of the reproductive age group, primarily with infertility, menstrual irregularity, obesity, metabolic syndrome, depression, anxiety, etc. And it will keep... Uh, go on to haunt the women in post perimenopause and postmenopause as well, if not taken care of properly. During pregnancy as well, PCOS can lead to spontaneous abortions, impaired glucose tolerance, gestational diabetes, hypertension, and small for gestational age babies. Uh, small for gestational age baby and PCOS goes hand in hand, uh, forming a vicious cycle. Uh, this is a very brief clear slide talking about the etiopathology, uh, various factors like lifestyle, genetics, now epigenetics, eventually uh, converge on hormonal changes, which are further exacerbated by obesity. 
and the two prime common features are insulin resistance and hyperandrogenism as we all know it is also being said that there is some element of low grade inflammation as well all in all these things combine and give rise to a uh, hirsutism acne oligo or anovulation leading to menstrual irregularity subfertility and also metabolic syndrome of course uh, if not addressed uh, and of course it is a neglected issue in our country primarily uh, psychosocial issues uh, relating to body image self esteem depression and anxiety this is again a little bit about pathophysiology i will not i don't want to go much into details uh some new kids on the block as far as etiopathogenesis is concerned fetal growth restriction or small for gestational age fetuses uh and high levels of androgens during the intrauterine period could lead to an increased production of glucocorticoids which may induce epigenetic modifications and increase the risk of pcos in this fetus there is also role of leptin and adiponectin there is a role of proteomics and metabolomics there is a definite role of oxidative stress and autoimmunity and now these new molecules called irisin which is a myokine is also being proposed and a consistent finding in a lot of pcos patients is low serum levels of vitamin d as far as the diagnostic criteria are concerned first criteria was proposed uh, that was proposed was nih criteria 1990 which essentially included hyperandrogenism and oligo or uh, amenorrhea the ashray rotterdam criteria is what we primarily use uh, in routine practice and it says that for uh, an adult reproductive age women two out of the three criteria clinical or biochemical hyperandrogenism oligo or anovulation and polycystic ovaries on ultrasound any two of the three have to be present to be labeled as pcos and the nexus pcos society did propose that the focus should be on hyperandrogenism but for all practical purposes what we adhere to is the rotterdam criteria uh, now this right here talks about the various phenotypes that we often hear of type a is what is right there in the center which will have all three features of hyperandrogenism and ovulation and polycystic ovaries type b uh, pco are the ones who will be hyperandrogenic and will have an ovulation they may not they most likely will not have polycystic ovaries on ultrasound type c will have hyperandrogenism with polycystic ovaries but are likely to present with regular menstrual cycles and type d is what is an ovulation and polycystic ovaries hyperandrogenism uh, can be diagnosed clinically by the presence of excessive acne allogenic alopecia using the ludwig visual score scale or hirsutism using the ferriman galway score uh, more than 4 to 6 and biochemically it can be diagnosed by elevated levels of total or free testosterone total testosterone is what is recommended and if total or test free testosterone is normal and if we still have suspicion of hyperandrogenism then we should get dhea tested ovulatory dysfunction refers to oligomenorrhea cycles more than 35 days apart but less than 6 months apart or amenorrhea that is absence of, of menstruation for 6 to 12 months after a cyclic pattern was established in reproductive age group 3 years post menarche to many perimenopause polycystic ovary now we have to uh, look at the frequency of the probe that was used and the route of the ultrasound that was used Uh, considering a conventional transvaginal scan using a routine three to five megahertz probe, then we would say uh, the ovary to be polycystic if it has more than twelve follicles per ovary. Uh, if the uh, if it's a new probe of more than eight megahertz, then more than twenty five follicles should be the cutoff. Uh, important thing is that if these findings are present in even one ovary, then also we can label it as polycystic ovary. the most important thing to note here is that usg uh, polycystic ovary appearance on ultrasound alone is not enough to define pcos because polycystic ovary morphology patients at least 60% would have normal ovulation also it is important to note that ultrasound should not be used for diagnosis in women less than 8 years of gynecological age that is 8 years post menarche and recommended minimum reporting standard uh, standards on ultrasound should be last menstrual period transducer frequency approach of the route assessed 
total follicle number per ovary, three dimensions and volume of each ovary, reporting of endometrial thickness and appearance is preferred, and other ovarian or uterine pathology if noted. It is also important as we have been uh, uh, being taught that it is important uh, PCOS is in diagnosis of exclusion. So these are the three routine conditions which should be excluded in every woman presenting with oligo or amenorrhea, uh, thyroid disease, prolactin excess, and non-classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia. This is again just an algorithm telling us how to proceed in reaching the diagnosis of PCOS. In adolescent girls, a quick word about uh, menstrual irregularity. From one to three years post menarche, cycle length of 21, less than 21 or more than 45 is considered abnormal. From three years to post menarche to perimenopause, again less than 21, but more than 35 or less than eight cycles per year is considered abnormal. From one year post menarche, more than 90 days for any one cycle should be evaluated further. And primary amenorrhea by the age of 15 years or more than three years after thilarche should also be evaluated. Uh, PCOS management strategies mainly aim at resolving the four major components of PCOS, including regularity of menstrual periods, control of hyperandrogenism, management of infertility, and management of insulin resistance along with its associated risk factors. So uh, it has to be a multidisciplinary approach, starting with lifestyle plan and support, treatment of the concerned symptoms, endometrial protection, contraception, fertility counseling, psychological and behavioral support, nutrition counseling, and metabolic screening and intervention. Uh, this is again an algorithm talking about how to proceed with management. The most important question to be addressed if a married reproductive age woman comes to us is, whether she is desirous of fertility or not. If she is desirous of fertility, then the treatment choices are limited. Then we have to give her ovulogens. Insulin resistance, uh, for that we can probably add metformin. Obesity, first line is lifestyle modification and hirsutism has to be taken care of with local therapies. If she is not desirous of fertility, then hormonal contraceptives is, uh, and lifestyle modica modification would be the mainstay. Uh, coming to each one of them one by one, there are no specific diet regime proven to be more effective than the other. So whatever suits the patient, she can uh, try that. What is important is to have a calorie deficit diet. The goals should be smart, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. Diet modification for calorie deficit should target a 30% calorie deficit or at least 500 to 750 kilocalories per day deficit. Exercise, minimum of 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity physical uh, activity or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity. Uh, a good uh, giveaway could be 10,000 steps per day, including 30 minutes of structured physical activity. Uh, this is again the same. Uh, however, the guideline uh, gives different criteria for prevention of weight gain and different for uh, weight loss and then prevention of weight regain. A little bit about diet, uh, we can probably counsel our patients based on this outline that uh, they should consume uh, less foods belonging to the low, uh, more of low glycemic index foods, fresh whole foods, non-starchy vegetables, minimize on starchy vegetables, uh, lean protein with low fat content, uh, good sources that yield 3 grams per serving, etc. Talking about the fertility management. This is the commonest ovulatory factor which we all uh, tackle in our uh, clinics. Uh, PCOS belongs to WHO category 2 in ovulation, that is normal gonadotropic, normal gonadism. And uh, it is a good practice to do tubal patency test and semen analysis before embarking on any ovulogen treatment. Eventually, the line of treatment would depend on the patient's age, presence or absence of other factors causing or contributing to infertility and the patient's experience and duration of previous treatment. Obviously, it is pointless to give clomiphene again to a patient who did not conceive with six cycles of clomiphene. So first-line therapy, uh, lifestyle modification, weight loss, and aromatase inhibitors or clomiphene citrate, may, uh, metformin may be added. 
second line therapy gonadotropins or laparoscopic ovarian drilling and ivf is usually the third line therapy unless there is another clear indication of subjecting the patient to ivf earlier a word about insulin sensitizers as we know pcos hovers around chronic anovulation and is an ovulatory dysfunction condition there is hyperandrogenism and there is insulin resistance unfortunately treatment with antiandrogens doesn't really help much in the ovulatory dysfunction on the other hand insulin sensitizers do help by improving the insulin resistance improving the hyperandrogenism indirectly and thereby improving the ovulatory dysfunction amongst the insulin sensitizers what we need to remember is that glucose metabolism abnormality precedes dyslipidemia in younger women the problem with insulin sensitizers and uh, talking about insulin resistance is that we still do not have any universal definition and therefore we do not have a standard clinical technique or treatment strategy general recommendation is that fasting insulin of more than 20 micro units per ml or fasting glucose to insulin ratio less than 4.5 it has been found to be 90% sensitive metformin is what we most commonly use and we have been using it for a long time it does not directly decrease bmi or adiposity and of course it has gi side effects and like i said there are no clear guidelines on the duration of metformin treatment either myonositol dechiroinositol uh, is the second line of insulin sensitizer sensitizer which we've been using of late it acts as a second messenger in the insulin signaling pathway and they may become an alternative for uh, improvement of pco women who do not tolerate metformin as per literature inositol therapy is still considered experimental a quick word about various adjuncts which are now available in the market including midci combination chromium picolinate melatonin berberine vitamin d l methylfolate almost all of them uh, midci uh, myo inositol will act at the ovary increase the glucose cell intake and thereby uh, normalize lh fsh ratio dci acts at the peripheral tissues increases insulin sensitivity and reduces hyperandrogenism Berberine has been said to increase insulin receptor expression thereby improving insulin sensitivity. L-methylfolate reduces hyperhomocysteinemia and therefore decreases insulin resistance. Chromium picolinate reduces insulin resistance by various mechanisms. Vitamin D like I mentioned earlier it has been a common finding in a lot of PCO women. Uh, so vitamin d is said to increase insulin sensitivity improve the menstrual irregularities improve the shbg levels and increase the androgen index melatonin improves ovarian function oocyte quality and embryo quality but unfortunately again there are no uh, calibrated uh, dosing schedule or protocol available there are no standardized dosing schedule or protocol available so they may be simple adjuncts that may be used for a short term we must remember that pcos is a lifelong disease what starts off as a ovarian condition goes on to become a metabolic condition initially the girl walks in with menstrual irregularity uh, clinical hyperandrogenism etc goes on to suffer from infertility and pregnancy complications and then lands up with glucose intolerance and cardiovascular diseases and endometrial cancer if left ignored so uh, uh, what is important is that we must keep this in mind whenever we face a pco patient at our first visit counsel them extensively remember talk about the long term effects and the role of lifestyle modification approximately 25 to 30% pco women will show impaired glucose tolerance by 30 years and as many as 8% of these women develop type 2 diabetes annually uh, the prevalence of type 2 diabetes is therefore seven times more than controls and this hyperinsulinemia which is observed in pco women eventually increases cardiovascular disease risk by a direct atherogenic action and by an adverse effect on the lipoprotein profile it also poses a almost three times excessive risk of ca endometrium and as per the rcog guideline the recommendation is that the woman should be allowed to have 
a withdrawal bleed at least every 90 days or three months. There is no clear association with CA breast or CA ovary yet and no place of insulin sensitizing agents for long-term benefits. Uh, what they mean is that even though we know that hyperinsulinemia is common to PCOS and central to PCOS, and even though we know that it is going to uh, cause various problems like CVD risk, etc., but yet there is no place of giving metformin forever just as a measure of prophylaxis. This is a cardiovascular risk stratification system in PCOS. As far as possible, we should try following it. At risk would be PCOS women with any of the following, obesity, cigarette smoking, hypertension, dyslipidemia, impaired glucose tolerance, etc. And high risk would be a PCOS woman with metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, overt vascular or renal disease, cardiovascular disease, etc. Uh, being a fertility person, I'm often grilled on the uh, cancer risk uh, with ovulogens and IVF in PCO patients. Uh, after doing a lot of research, what I found was that till date, what they have observed is that the routine dose of ovulogens is safe in women and a woman with PCOS can be reassured that there is no direct observed uh, increase in any of the malignancies. However, infertility itself or uh, nulliparity itself or obesity itself could be a confounding factor and could be a high risk factor for these women. What is also important is to adhere to the safety guidelines, adhere to the protocols which have been proposed. For example, clomiphene citrate should not be used for more than six months at a stretch. Uh, this is a brief sum up of various guidelines and recommendations. So for adult women, two out of the three Rotterdam criteria should be fulfilled before we label a woman as PCOS. In case of adolescence, oligo or anovulation with hyperandrogenism is necessary. Ultrasound is not needed. There is absolutely no place of FSH, LH or AMH in forming a diagnosis of PCOS. Baseline glycemic evaluation and baseline lipid profile evaluation is a must in all these women once the diagnosis is confirmed. Metformin may be used temporarily as an adjuvant with any of the ovulogens or for impaired glucose tolerance. Consider MIDCI combination if there is metformin intolerance. And the most important thing is counsel, counsel, counsel. Lifestyle modification is the mainstay of this condition because it is going to stay with her forever. The treatment has to be of specific symptoms at whatever point of life the patient has come to us. We must get into the habit of looking beyond fertility in a woman with PCOS. In case of adolescence, lifestyle modification plus OC pill is the mainstay, uh, both for hirsutism, acne and menstrual irregularity. In, uh, in reproductive age group, we must see whether the woman is, has come for fertility issues or whether menstrual concern is her main problem. And in premenopausal or perimenopausal women, we must screen for long-term risks, uh, endometrial carcinoma, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes mellitus prevention and management. This is a very good extensive guideline which covers all these aspects beautifully and I would recommend going through it once for everyone. Thank you so much. I am uh, extremely grateful. I am here because of all my teachers and uh, it has been a pleasure being a part of this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank for such a nice talk. Uh, really, it will help us in our clinical practice. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Now I would like thank to you so much. thank you. Now I would like to request Dr. Megha Bandil for uh, the uh, vote of thanks. Dr. Megha. A very good evening to everyone. Thanksgiving is not merely a ritual. It is an opportunity of heartfelt gratitude towards our esteemed guest and painstaking host for making this event a grand success. I, Dr. Megha Bandil, is interested with the responsibility of expressing my deepest gratitude to our distinguished delegates and fantabulous faculty. To begin with, I would like to extend my utmost regard 
to our guest of honor, Dean, Professor and Head of Gynec Oncology Department of Cancer Hospital and Research Institute, Gwalior, none other than Dr. SBL Shwastasa. Without his mentorship and consistent support, this event is not enlightened. I express my humble thanks to our special guest, Dr. Jyoti Bindal Ma'am, President MPOC's Vice Chancellor Arbindo University, without her meticulous guidance. This event would not have been seen the light of this day. Ma'am, you have been a mentor and a great motivator for so many people. I would also like to express my utmost regard to our special guest, Professor and Head, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, NSCB Medical College, Jabalpur, Dr. Kavita N. Singh, ma'am, for her graceful guidance and presence. I must mention my deepest sense of thanks to our eminent speaker, Dr. Jedi Bhomik, sir, who took out his precious time and grace all of us with his knowledge. Sir, you have covered each and every important aspect related to the ovarian carcinoma and make this topic interesting. Thank you once again, sir, to tell about the uh, importance of the cytoreductive surgery, HIPEC, post-op care and follow-up of the patients. I also wish to express my gratitude and uh, thanks to an eminent speaker, Dr. Samir Patham, sir. Uh, sir, you nicely explained the role of the radiotherapy and its importance and uh, um, uh, about the next generation radiotherapy, which gives us the importance of the target organ radiation rather than the whole area. I am also grateful to express my gratitude to Dr. Deepti Gupta. Uh, Ma'am, you have very well enlightened us with the PCS diagnosis and its management. You very well cover such a wide topic in a precise manner. I must mention my deepest sense of appreciation and applause for our honorable chairpersons, Dr. Bhagi Lakshmi Naik, ma'am, Dr. Priya Ganesh Kumar, ma'am, Dr. Kusumlata Singhal, ma'am, Dr. Mudita uh, Jain, ma'am, to very well cheer the session in a very interactive manner. I would also like to acknowledge our special and heartiest thank to our President Agoy, MP Chapter, and Professor Dr. Yashodra Gaur, ma'am. Without her esteemed guidance, support, and encouragement, this event would not be possible. For so many people like me, your aura and grandeur is surely unmeshed. I may also like to express my sincere thanks to Dr. Urmila Tripathi, ma'am, Secretary MP Chapter Agoy. Her zeal and jest is simply contagious. I would also like to ex extend my gratitude to Dr. Monica Divan, ma'am, the Joint Secretary and the coordinator of this event without her guidance and constant efforts. This event would not be a success. I would also like to thanks to all the delegates and the participants who attend this webinar. And last but not the least, I would like to thank to the team Blisson for their enormous cooperation in the organizing this event. Thank you so much. <laughs>